What's happening, weirdos? This is the incredible Felipe Esparza, who is an incredible stand-up comedian. He won Last Comic Standing. He also has just a very, very interesting story and is a good and funny and kind and nice guy. And I'm really glad you guys are here to listen in on our conversation. Only a couple things to plug up top. If you go to PeteHolmes.com, you'll see that I am going to be in Los Angeles on May 4th. May the 4th. Uh, it's going to be with us. Uh, go to PeteHolmes.com. That's the Netflix is a Joke Festival at the Wilshire Ebel Ebel Theater. Uh, and also my tickets to Chicago are on there. I'm also going to be, we're gonna, I'm going to make sure this is added. I'm going to be also in L.A. at the, Br not the Brea Improv, the Irvine Improv. So we'll add tickets uh, to PeteHolmes.com. Uh, I'll be at Largo on January 30th as well. If you like the show and you want to support it, why not try a Pete's Pick? Uh, one of them, Modern Mammals. I talk about this constantly. Modern Mammals is the only shampoo that I found that cleans your hair but doesn't look like you shampooed your hair. Because let's be honest, when you shampoo your hair, it looks like absolute shit. It looks like a bale of hay that you toss in a dryer, gets crisped. It gets unruly. It looks terrible. Usually if I had a, a TV appearance or an important uh, event where I had to look good, my strategy was I wouldn't wash my hair for two, three, four days leading up to it so it would have some of that natural moisture, some of that hold. Now, modern mammals can clean my hair. My hairdresser used to complain, Cat, my friend, that my hair was dirty, that it was gross. And it was, because I wasn't cleaning it, because I didn't want it to look like crap. Modern Mammals cleans your hair, but it maintains that natural hold and that some of that oil and some of that, I don't know how to explain it. It keeps it looking great. It's almost like you have product in your hair, almost like a dry shampoo, but when you wash it, it looks as good as it can. So there have only, already got 40,000 guys that have switched to Modern Mammals instead of traditional shampoo. Once you use it, you will be hooked for life. I tell people about it all the time. It's a small grassroots punk rock company. I absolutely love it. They have bars for the no plastic version with no fragrance or bottles, which is like a magic gray mud that I love the feeling and the smell of that gets your hair perfect every single time. Six seconds to perfect hair. Go to modernmammals.com slash weird where people can get a special combo deal and try both products, the bar and the bottle, for 44 bucks. That lasts a really, really long time. So 44 bucks for both. You'll be set for a while and your hair will look perfect and won't look like absolute shit. Shampoo sucks. Go to Modern Mammals. Uh, also, we're brought to us by another piece of uh, technology. I guess you could call Modern Mammals technology. If there's one piece of actual tech that has changed my life more than any other in the past years, it is hands down my Apollo Neuro, which I'm wearing right now. I'm always wearing it when I do late night, when I do stand up. What is it? It's a wearable piece of tech that helps your body recover from stress, that sends vibrations into your body, sending a signal to your nervous system that gives it the sensation of being held or touched. It's like a wearable virtual hug that helps calm and regulate your nervous system. It can help you relax, sleep, focus, and be more productive. I was just writing before I did this intro. I had it set to focus, which they have the data to back, helps fight off symptoms of ADD. It's a wearable hug using touch therapy to help you feel safe and in control. You can wear it on the wrist like I do or on your ankle. It helps me fall asleep and stay asleep at night. In fact, that's a new feature that they've updated that it will sense when you have woken up and rerun the program without you even doing anything. So sometimes I'm awake in the night and I'll just notice my Apollo's turned back on and it lulls me back to sleep. Rebuild and recover, wonderful for after you've been stressed. Calm, which is wonderful for meditation. Unwind, which is what I put it on when I'm watching TV at the end of the day to help me prepare for bed. It's wonderful for energy, focus, sleep, relaxation. 
It is a game changer and a life changer. Devel developed by a neuroscientist and a board certified psychiatrist who've been studying the impacts of chronic stress in humans for nearly 15 years. Apollo's effects on stress, sleep, cognitive performance, and recovery have been proven in multiple clinical trials and real world studies. So this is not a mood ring. This is not a crystal. This is hard science. 10% off. Go to apolloneuro.com slash weird. Get one for yourself. Get one for a friend. It's a wonderful gift. We've given many as gifts. 10% off. A-P-O-L-L-O-N-E-U-R-O.com slash weird. All right, everybody. Enjoy. Felipe Esparza. I like this. I like what I'm looking at. Yeah, my wife got this for me. I that, the I'm whole outfit? Yeah. Oh, it's a suit. You didn't match it. It came together. Yes. Federacion Colombia. Colombiana de not football. Colombian, I like the Could you take it off if you're not Colombian? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's funny. You know what? second you were like. I thought that man. Really? I met a man at the airport. I thought he was going to say that. Take it off? Yeah, because he goes, Are Colombiano? I said, No, soy Mexicano. I'm Mexican. And then he said, oh, okay, I like it. <laughs> oh, he was okay with it. They're great colors. Yeah. I like the whole thing. And the, the shoes, you picked those out? No, I didn't. My wife got the whole outfit. She did the whole thing? Yeah. She do that with you? Yeah. She dress you? I mean, like, in general, is that like a thing in no. your relationship? She had a lot of, um, I, I have a lot of track suits. That What's are, going on uh, with the watch? I was just Tell looking at it. this watch. That's a nice watch. Thank you, man. Come on, Felipe. Tell you me about that watch. It's you a, a watch guy? No. <laughs> no. You know, it's funny because no. I work with, um, I got an email. No, I got a text from comedian um, Eddie Griffin. Yeah. And, he, and he, he saw one of my reels, and he wanted to be on a show. But I, and I thought it was going to be like to open, maybe open the show. But now man, he wanted to be in the show with him and Gary Owens and... Like a stand-up show. Gary Owens and D.L. Hughley and er, um, Cedric Entertainer. Whoa. I was in the same bill with them, you know? Yo, it already happened. It already happened. And I was, he got, and then I went to I went to everybody's green room to talk to them, and D.L. Hughley said, what kind of watch is that? And I said, um, Filson? Yeah. And then he goes, Filson? <laughs> he said, Filson? And um, never heard of it. And I said, I know um, so old companies that don't exist no more. They were bought by um, by another company um, with a C-H, S-H, Chinook, or... I wouldn't know. It's like an old reference when um, he don't know something from Shike. Oh, Sh Shinola. Shinola. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Shinola is a company, and they bought this company, I, I guess. And now they make that? Yeah, but this one... Where'd you get it, though? I, I bought it off the internet. Oh, you did buy it. And I have two of them. You like it? I like it. I thought, I thought this story was going to end, and then Eddie Griffith gave you that no, he, watch. No, but Russell Peters, comedian, he gave I me two him. watches. Russell's I lost one of them. Crazy generous, isn't yeah. he? I did a. I, he did this podcast. I went to his house, and I think he meant it. He was like, "If you're ever here, just text me, and I'll let you in the house, and you can just hang out at the house." And I was like, "What?" But I think he meant it. Yeah, when I opened up for him in Canada, I was there for for a month. I went um, shopping with him, and he was like um, Taylor Swift over there. Oh yeah, they were all over him. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like everybody was. He, he needed a security. Was it brown Canadians or just Canada in general? Because I know he's huge in the Asian it was all, world. It was like me walking into East Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> like, like they wanted to just come on in, taste our food. But where's my daughter? <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Can't get up no more. Please help me. You know what's crazy is so in prep for the interview or this conversation, it's not an interview, it's not Barbara Walters. Yeah, that's for you. What is it? Shake it up and drink it. What is it for? It's got caffeine, nootropics, and uh, adaptogens. It helps you calm down and picks you up. About as much caffeine as half a cup of coffee. It's called Magic Mind. Is like a, is, does that milk in it? No. It's just green tea, a little bit of agave. Down it? Just shoot it, it man. Good. It tastes great, but it'll make you uh, happy. <laughs> that sounds like somebody just gave you drugs. It'll make you happy. You don't have to like the taste. Oh, man. Your face didn't like the taste. To like NyQuil. <laughs> it's with more of no, a day no taste. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's it's not a sip and enjoy. It's like you'll like how you feel in ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Or like you let me know. 
I don't it's not know. like drugs, right? I'm like sober. No, no, no. It's not. It's not. I wouldn't have given yeah. that to you. <laughs> yeah, you were in rehab for something. What was that? I was in rehab when I was like a, a young adult, like late teens, early twenties. Late teens. So when did you get introduced? Um, I started drinking since I was fifteen. Really? My mom and dad they would have um, parties at my uncle's house that there was always beer around. And you just so drink. We just sneak. My brother and I would sneak a little beer and take it with my cousins, and we'll, we'll pass it around. <laughs> oh no! We were kids, and then I ended up um, just drinking um, forty ounces. Yeah, <clears throat> that's malt liquor. Malt liquor. Yeah, because where I lived, there was a lick, uh, uh, a little market, and the guy didn't car nobody. Really? No, he would. We would just go in there and just buy two forties and no ID. No shit. No nothing. Um, kids will come in and with a little note, sell my daughter a pack of marble cigarettes. She's eight, and they will just sell it to her. Because maybe that happened honestly once, and now it's just a scam. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's crazy. So booze was the one that got you. Yeah, booze. And then later on, I started doing other stuff. Around 15? No, when I was 20. 20. Yeah. So take me through that. Like, when did it start becoming... By the way, this is in the interest of healing. It's not like a page six gossip thing. Yeah. But here you are. I'm just so impressed with your life and everything you're doing. So it's very interesting. You immigrated from Mexico. I yeah, know that the story. 80s. Yeah. Took three tries. Yeah. And then you got into Los Angeles, East mm -hmm. Los Angeles. Your Boyle Heights, actually. Okay. I think it was Boyle Heights. Because it was off the five freeway. Yeah. Okay. By Soto Street General Hospital. And what was what was your life like that you felt, you know, that alcohol was trying to fix something? You know what I mean? I, I didn't even really like think about it like that. No, I, I know, but now drunk. that you're a grown man. Yeah. Yeah, but was were you stressed as a kid? Was there something or was it just bored? This, this spelling bee is getting to my head, man. What is? <laughs> this spelling bee is getting to my head. <laughs> this teacher keep busting out these pop quizzes. Yeah, but we're, me. <laughs> Something had to be grinding at know. you. I just thought that was everybody looked happy, so I want to be cool too. You just wanted to fit in, but then it got it. It's like hooking you, like you have the allergy. Yeah, man. I remember um, living with a girlfriend, and she said, "You better not drink." And I said, "Okay." And I would, um, I would go in the bathroom and lock the door and pop up a bath, and then chill inside with a a six pack. <laughs> Listening to NWA. <laughs> that that dope should man, be a screensaver. <laughs> Felipe in a bubble bath, Coward, hiding from you know, his girlfriend. Hiding from his girlfriend in the bathroom. Right, right. So it wasn't just, it, it went pretty quickly from being something fun and cool to something you needed, right? I mean, you tell me. It sounds like, that sounds like somebody that's like, <clears throat> it's not a casual thing. I never thing. thought about it as something I needed. It just felt like something I wanted to do. Yeah. Like, I, could, I remember... Um, being three days sober and goes, man, I feel like I could conquer the world again. Yeah. And then I go back to being drunk. Yeah. And what, I mean, it just too uncomfortable to not, or you just liked it. I liked it. Yeah. I miss When it. did it start being a problem? Like, what was the moment where you were like, this is not cool? I guess when um, I started fighting with people. You were an aggressive kind of drunk. Yeah. I would have like, get, not violent, but like, I remember like, if it's like if somebody told me something like five years ago and I was like, didn't have the confidence or the, to fight him or approach him. Then I will see him now. Mm. Go, hey, man, remember five years ago? Mm. You took a lot of shit in fifth grade. <laughs> now you'll confront them? If, no, when I was drunk. Oh, I when would. you were drunk, you'd look them up. <laughs> so you'd start getting in fights. Yeah. There was dumb fights, too, because, like, I remember this guy came out of prison. He must have been in prison for, like, 10 years. Mm. And they used to call him Batman. <laughs> that was his name, Batman. Really? His real name was Steve. <clears throat> Steve, right? <laughs> well, Bruce. You so, know. And I'm hanging out with my friends. I must be like 19 years old, 20. Mm. And he passes by. He's like in his 30s. He just come out of prison. And my friends are like calling him, what's up, Batman? And he goes, and he goes what's up, man? And they go, they go, nah, man, this Batman. He's Batman too. You? Well, yeah, he was. Because they were telling him, what's up, man? 
They go, not you, this Batman right here. And okay. he'll get mad. And he, this is a problem. Then he came over here, which Batman? Then he pointed at me, this one. He mad. And he, he wanted to fight over the name. Wow. And I said, now, nah, man, we're, I, we're, I told him, we're not going to fight over a name. We're just going to fight. <laughs> you said that like Javier Bardem, goes, man. At the end of the, like, at the end, we're just going to fight. We're just going to fight. <laughs> And I'm gonna still be Batman, and you can continue to still be Batman. Go, I'm not gonna fight for no stupid name. And then you just fought. Yeah, is that was a thing? You just you got in fights. Yeah, he was drunk, and I was drunk, so it was like a short fight. Yeah. Hmm. You know, I had Father Greg Boyle on the pod. That's part of how I know about you. Oh yeah, he's a good man. I helped him. Yeah, he helped me. Yeah. I used to win when he. I knew him before I was, when I was sober too. When I was a young teenager. Oh really? Um, a lot of my friends that I have that I have now, I have a friend that works for um, Southwest Airlines mm. in Burbank, mm -hmm. Joe Barone, and him, him and him and I we we hit it off because he goes, "Hey, um, Father Greg baptized me mm. in in uh, juvenile hall," <laughs> so that's how we became friends. But I, I grew up in the, in the same neighborhood where Father Greg Boyle was a Jesuit priest. Yeah. And I remember when he was, when I was like a little kid, I saw in a newspaper clip that he was caught by the Contras in South America, I guess. Mm. Somewhere in Nicaragua, El Salvador. Yeah. And um, as soon as they found out who he was, they blindfolded him and they dropped him off somewhere in the jungle. And they called the authorities and told them where to find him. And no they, way. They, they let, let him, him go. go. Wow. That's, uh, it's funny. It's hard to get Father Greg to brag, but if I was him, I'd brag. Like, he, he tells stories that, like, they'd be like a drive-by or something, and all the homies jump on him, like the Secret Service, to protect him. And I'm like, that is so incredible that, that people love you that much, but you'd never meet a more humble person. Yeah. Like, imagine if a comic was like, I was kidnapped by, you know, terrorists in the jungle. But when they found out who I was, they just let me go. I mean, that you'd never hear the end of it. But that's not even one of his top ten stories. Yeah, when I when I saw when I knew him, it was before he had um, Homeboy Industry. Mm. It was called um, Jobs for the Jobs Future. Jobs for a Future. Yeah. Um, nothing stops with the, the logo. Nothing stops a bullet like a, a bullet gun. like a job. Job. Right? I yeah. said like a gun. Like a and job. And I were watching. Um, what was that show with Gary Shandling? Larry Sanders? Larry Sanders. And one of the writers came in wearing a Homeboy Industry shirt. Oh, really? Yeah, the original one. It was a black one with a red and red, white, and green letters. Yeah. And it said Homeboy Industry. And I said, like, oh, there it is. That's crazy. I wonder if Gary knew them and loved them. I, I mean, that's that's. It was a, a it was a writer that he you know, that was a regular writer on the show. Yeah, he would always fight with him. Yeah, about jokes. Yeah, it was that writer. <laughs> but I thought that was cool. But of all the, so I listen to Father Greg's books constantly. I just love them so much. And today on the ride down, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll listen to one. And there's three of them, and they're each about six hours long. You know, six hours of him audiobook. So I put on one at random. And I hit play, so it's 18 hours of him talking. The one that I hit play on, he quotes you. What are the chances? I'm driving Which to talk to one? you. It's in the whole language. It's like chapter nine or something, so right Whoa. in the middle. And he goes, as Felipe Esparza says, gangs aren't all bad, they carpool. Yeah. And I was like, what are the chances? <laughs> Dude, I'm driving to meet you. And that was what came on. I was like, "This is that's a synchronicity." That was crazy. There's nothing good about gang banging. They said that they are they all carpool. Yeah, they're like, "Come on, homie, get in here. Let's all get caught." <laughs> <laughs> I, to, I remember I did a birthday a, a birthday show for him in the morning at Homeboy Industry, and I remember I was like, "Really?" It was more like a roast of Homeboy Industry. Yeah, the way they work and the way they operate, and everybody was laughing. I remember I tried to get a job here at Homeboy Industry and. And they interviewed me, and they asked me, um, you ever been shot? No. He goes, you ever been in a gang? No. He goes, you ever been in jail? No. Nope. Okay, man, you don't meet the qualifications. <laughs> so I went out there and got shot two times, went to prison. They gave me the keys to the truck. <laughs> it is like an upside-down world in that way. I was, 
with my wife, we're trying to buy um, merchandise. We're trying to start our own merch for to sell at the end of the show. So we went to a Homeboy Industries skills um, silk screen. Yeah, and um, it was run, it's run by an old friend of mine that grew up in a neighborhood named named Ruben, and he wasn't there, but his um, nephews were there and some other kid I recognized. Because my mom used to babysit his older brother mm. when they were little, but now he's this big six foot two gangbanger, and they're taking our order. We're talking, and then these four other dudes come in, and they were wearing masks like handkerchiefs, mm. like bank robbers, you know, like in the eighteen hundreds. Yeah, hey, stick it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're wearing um hats, and and sunglasses, and I thought. They were part of the crew that worked somewhere in the like back. Like they're in the warehouse. And they got real dusty, right? Yeah. They, they came in dusty. And I, and then they came in there and they looked. And I looked at them and goes, man, you guys should get some, 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 um, some, what they call some, some, for their nose, their faces, what they called, um, you what, mean- like a, a full mask? Yes, you better mask for yeah, these yeah, guys. Yeah, it covers man. up your whole face. These guys look weird, <laughs> eh? Anyways, so when they left, the guy that was helping us, he was gone. Everybody was gone. They came there to shoot somebody. Oh, no. Yeah, they were there to shoot somebody. They came in there and said, they looked around, and I didn't know. that. I, then, I, then I went through, like, Facebook. Oh, yeah, somebody was shot where I used to live. Mm. By the rivals of where my elementary school used to be, Whoa. so they were they were there to kill somebody, and they saw my wife with white blonde hair, blue eyes, and they saw my stepson, four years old, playing with his car on the floor. They said, "Oh man, there's white people here, man. Everybody not shoot nobody here." Is that <laughs> real? Yeah, because that's one of the most. <laughs> that so is... I'm thinking, they said, "Oh shit, there's white people here, hey." Eh? He goes, we, we, we go, this is, they're going to add more charges to our crimes now. Oh, so, my um, God. And, and I think one of the guys recognized me from the neighborhood because came, when they came in, I just said, what's up, fool? And they went about their business and they left. And then I, I made a, I said, I told him, man, you, you should, I told the guy, you should call all the other places mm. where you have gangbangers working at. Mm. And tell them, hey man, these guys came in, man. I don't think they were looking for jobs. Right, <laughs> right. It wasn't like uh, in the good way. Yes. Yeah, that's crazy. But I mean, who working? Not. I'm not trying to be funny. Who working there couldn't think of somebody that might an enemy? Like who doesn't have an enemy? I know. That's they, one of the tense things about this life. That's what I was. Kinda... That's that's in that. That's one of the. That's one of Father Greg Boyle's books too. How these guys are working with enemies every day. Right. Right, they used to shoot bullets, now they shoot texts. Yeah. And that's what's so beautiful about it, because a gang is a group, it's really hard to change a group, but an individual that's, I was just listening to it, he's like, that you invite into a new group. He's like, you can't like just take the idea out of someone's head, you give them a new idea and a new group and a new identity. I think that all the time, it's like groups, I can't fuck with groups, it's too much. You know what I mean, reforming an entire group. But if you give one guy, you know what I mean? Did you see that movie Green Book? I talk about uh, all this time, all the time. Green Book is a white racist dude. Is, driving the is yeah, hired to drive the black guy. Yes. Yeah. And it, by the end of the trip, guess what? He's not racist anymore. You know what I mean? See, that's an individual. You know what I mean? Like I can't make every white dude or Italian or whatever he is in the in the seventies not racist, but like one guy on a car trip, and that seems to be like the homeboy way. It's like. Come in here. Let's just talk to an individual. I don't want to know about your your neighbor, your, where you're yeah. from, or whatever. We just want to talk to one heart, and that seems to be part of the strategy. What do you mean when when he helped you? What was that, Greg, Father Greg? Oh, Father Greg. Um, he didn't have a car yet. I mean, he had a car, but it, it belonged to other peri- other priests. Mm. He was just cruising with on a beach cruiser. Mm. So he was driving around three in the morning. I remember this beach time. cruiser. Yeah, on the bike. And a bicycle. And my mother must have called Father Great Boyle because I know I didn't. And he came to my house. <laughs> Why? What was she what was going on that she was like, This guy needs a priest? <laughs> I was going I was like drinking too much at this time now. And I got into a lot of fights. Yeah. With more Batmans and Jokers and Penguins. <laughs> 
Are you and getting hurt in these fights? Are these serious fights? I'm getting hurt, man. You're getting hurt. Hospital? No, just busted eye. Yeah. You know, I'm but your mom's worried about a you. Bleeding nose. Just a black guy all the time. A black guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Constantly with a black guy. Isn't that really, if you're growing up in, are you in a neighborhood with gang activity? Isn't mm -hmm. it tricky? What if Batman's in a group? There's gang activity, but the, most of the fights that, are, that, are, that happen inside like a, a neighborhood where there's usually one gang, everybody just fights amongst each other. Oh, really? Yeah, like there might be a, a gang, part of the gang that's 19 years old and 20. Mm -hmm. They're like a newer gang. Mm -hmm. That's in the gang. But then you got people who are in their 20s and 30s. Then there's people who are in their 40s and 50s mm -hmm. who are a different generation. You put them all together and there's alcohol, there's always a fight. Mm -hmm. That's got to be a trip to be in a gang for 30 years. My friend <laughs> who's sober 35 years, he's from a gang called White Fence uh -huh. from East Los Angeles. And then there's another a White Fence there's two white fans. White fans are like the oldest gang in Los Angeles. Huh. They've been around since the 30s, you know? And they, they had a, a reunion, hmm. like a reunion of all the original guys. In a, cause, and um, my friend, um, he's been, so, he's been a sober 35 years, and he went to the reunion. And he goes, what happened? Oh, I had to leave early. What, why? That's ah, a big fight. Yeah. He goes, what happened? Oh, uh, some, some, here's the way he said it. Some clica didn't like that they were not in the invitation and all hell broke loose. Whoa. And then what she means that one, like, a, a, one part of the gang, like a clique, was not mentioned in the invitation. Oh, so wow. there was like a, a, a dispute between the older guys. See, it is like running a and this is what he told corporation me. or something. Like there's there's feelings. It's like who gets invited, who, who gets set. It's like planning a wedding or something. It's like who gets the honor and all that stuff. So it's this thing that seems so, you know, street or whatever. But it has these similarities to like the McDonald's quarterly Christmas party. You know what I'm saying? Or, or, even if you make stuff up, people, like I remember, you know how every year they, they have... Um, they have that big concert in the desert. Um, Burning Man. Not Burning Man. And the other one where all the, th like three days. I looked to Katie. Coachella. Coachella. So it's like all rock. You know, one is rock. Then there's another one that happened later on. It's all country. Stagecoach. Yeah. yeah. But I made a thing of Coachella. But like um, all, um, every Latin comedian that I can think of, I put it this night, <laughs> headlining George Lopez, you know, and. And I put um, another comic, second night, Gabriel Iglesias, mm. third night, Fools Gone Wild, you know? <laughs> and I was I put myself in two. Then I put a, every, any, every type of comedian that would be in the George Lopez show, you know, mm. like that I could think of from Texas, from Puerto Rico, anybody that's Latino. Mm. And I put them all there. Then I put the, with the Gabriel one, everybody with, that he might be, comfortable working with you know i put angela johnson you know i put um a list right then i put the and the fool's gone wild george perez me can flow um ralph barbosa you know and all these names people in the comments started complaining oh man this guy shouldn't be on that list why? Wait, <laughs> what? Wait, what, do you, what do you mean? He shouldn't be in my makeup list. What well, I made up in my <laughs> you head. made up list? Oh, you're saying the politics extended yeah. to comedy as yeah. well. He goes, oh, so Messia, Carlos Messia shouldn't be on day two. He should be on day five. And I'm like, bro, there is no day five. Exactly. <laughs> and people are arguing on it. I took it down. It's make-believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're fighting I about it. I took down my make-believe post because <laughs> I was getting serious, <laughs> mad comments. How were the shows? But after, huh? Were the shows good? There was no show. I just made it up. I mean, but did it happen? Never. Oh, it never it happened. happened. Oh, it was I pretend. just made it up. It was that pretend. It was a fake Coachella. The whole thing was fake. The whole thing was fake. Dude, I thought it was real, but the list, you're like, the list. Because I know. saw like, um, I saw a list, that the fake Coachella list. You just go look up the app and go, I'm a I'm fake Coachella list. And then you start putting your own uh... bands, your own preference. So I saw one that this night will be Hulu. And they had all the Hulu shows. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do one with Latin comics. So then I put them, this night, this guy be headlining. Then a bunch of younger comics on the bottom. 
man, me and my friend, we we actually work hard on this fake list. <laughs> that we put in like three hours trying to find names. And still people are mad. And then people that were not on it were like, oh, man, I should have been on it. Dude, that's like, there was that website, The 100 Top Stand-Up Comedians. You remember that? Yes. It was a joke. But I know people that were like checking where they are. I'm like, no, it's a joke. It's a joke. The whole thing's a joke. But we still looked at it. We want to be on the list, man. Yeah. I'm or like when, um, also when, um, like a Rolling Stone comes out with a top 100 comedians. Yeah. And everybody, somebody starts watching it. All the same 10 people. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Silverman. You yeah. Know, sure. uh, all these people. All her, and all her friends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they get mad. They would tell and all these people. Well, lists are, it's funny. When I watch my daughter playing and she excludes someone, you know, she doesn't want to play. How old is your daughter? She's five. Oh. So let's say there's a younger kid. This is normal. There's like a baby. You know, when babies stop being babies, they immediately turn on babies. Babies hating babies. And I'm like, you were just a baby. You should remember what this was like. But she instantly, you know, wants to establish herself as a big girl. So she wants to play with someone who's older or her age. And maybe there's a little baby trying to get in. And I can see her, like, exclude her. And, of course, I say, you know, baby, don't exclude. You know, let her play. And then I was thinking about it. I was like, that's so funny because all grown-ups are doing is excluding. First class, comedian list, you're invited on the podcast. Who didn't I invite on the podcast? That's all we do. That's how we make meaning. Life is just like, what car do you have? Who's your wife? Like, this is my wife. You can't have her. It's all excluding. Do you know what I'm saying? So we teach kids don't exclude as if that's preparing them for the world in any way. You should. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But then I'm like, and then baby, when you're 18, I'll teach you how to exclude real good. Here's how we exclude. You got to work hard so you can uh, fly premium economy. That's the yeah. first exclusion. You know what I'm saying? And then we got the real fancy pants. They're in the private jet. We all admire them because they're excluding the most. The, the billionaires, that's their exclusion masters. And they're the heroes of our country. Cut to us on the playground going like, let everyone play. Why don't we do that? No one's letting everyone play. No one. Does that make sense? Yeah, man. That's not... You're not in first class. You're in business select first class. <laughs> exactly. You're not a diamond, ma like the Delta. When you're in line to board a plane, and I, let's say I'm in first class, and you're flying Delta, they announce 15 groups that board before first class. I know this, so I'm, I can relax, but I watch the other people, and they're going, I'm, I'm group one. I'm group one. I'm like, man, on Delta, group one is group seven. You're about to watch... <laughs> Parents with children, people who need assistance. Then you're going to watch the military. Then you're going to watch the uh, 1K members. Then you're going to watch the Diamond Elite members. That, then they'll get to you, and it's like the plane's half full. And it's like, sorry, dude. Like, eat shit. You lose. <laughs> I remember they were like, they were mentioning um, Concierge Key. Concierge Key is yeah. another one. And, and, um, and I remember asked this, this old man, like this old like, he looked like a guy that just travels all day. He had that face, you know, like he could be a pilot with that face. <laughs> he got pilot face. Yeah, man, and he was old. And then he goes, I asked him, what's concert key? And I forgot his comment, but he said something like, if you don't know, you're not going to, you're not on it or something like that, whatever. If you have to ask, you'll yeah, never so know. Yeah, so you have to ask, whatever, yeah. right? And I looked at him and I said, well, you're not on it. So I want to know, maybe you know. Right. You don't, you're not in it. You're not in it. You had to ask. So you don't know. Why are you at, see, this is exactly my point. The like people. You have just been like, I don't know either. Or so <laughs> a million, I just want to know, I should have just asked them, listen, you motherfucker, how many miles did it take to be that shit? That I don't know what it is. <laughs> But he's buying into the idea that it's called concierge key. That's just two words that mean you fly way too much. It should be the so sorry you never see your family group. <laughs> Man, I, I I flew on, I think it was United. I was first class on United. And the guy that was sitting next to me, he was, uh, I don't know if he was lying or something. He said he was James Franco's bodyguard. <laughs> and he's like a big bodyguard and. He was, um, I don't know what he was. He was he, trying to get on the plane by saying, I'm James Franco's no, bodyguard. No, he was on the plane already in me, with me. Oh, okay. And first class. And he's telling me. you. 
But he's telling me that, that he's like a, he has like over millions of miles from traveling with James Franco and traveling with other people that he protects. He said that when he gets on a plane, he's greeted, and I saw him being greeted by a, by a, a real well dressed flight attendant, like not the ones that are in a plane. Mm. This little she looked like a model, and she said, "Welcome, Mr. Lopez Gonzalez, big old Mexican dude." Welcome, welcome, Mr. Gonzalez. And she gave him a bottle of water on the way in. Yeah, and so then he when got he got a got human. In, yeah, when he got in there, the guy, the guy greeted him like this, and then he sat down. On the way out, there was a lady waiting for him and told him, "Um, your your um baggage claim is this." She was explaining everything. To right, him. you get human. Like it's not AI, but it's a human acting like they're an AI just for you. I was on a we went we, we I flew to Chicago with him and we had a layover. And he took me to the the, the lounge, you know, of United. Yeah. And yeah. it was a big lounge, man. Yeah. There was a place to nap and masturbate. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. Be there. I've masturbated there. Yeah. That's and nice. There was uh, showers. <laughs> there was food. <laughs> yeah, the free food. I see a lot of people in those first class lounges, try, like they can't handle that it's free. So you, the real frequent travelers are just sitting. They're just sitting there checking their phone. They're making sure they... But the people that are there for the first time, they're like getting nine desserts. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like me, put them in your bag. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's like my parents. Once you hit a certain age, you put the rolls in your purse. My parents are fine financially. They're fine. Bread, butter, everything's going in the purse. And I'm looking at them and I'm like, when does this happen? Like something just clicks in your brain and you're like, I'm old. The bread's coming. I think that their, what, their parents grew up in a depression. That's what I agree. But like they didn't, isn't it funny? You inherit what they did. The fear. I just uh, Neil Brennan sent me this talk, and they were like, "Try." A psychologist was saying, "Try to imagine what were your parents afraid of? What were they struggling with? And how did that get handed over to you? Like, how are you irrationally worried about what your parents were worried about, even though maybe and very likely you shouldn't be, but you just get it, like." It's crazy. Like your genes carry a memory. Have I told this story on the pod? I read this book. I forget what it was, but there was this dude who couldn't sleep because he was 18 years old. And every night at 3 a.m. he woke up and he, and he couldn't go back to sleep. So he had insomnia. Nothing was helping. They gave him Ambien. Didn't matter. 3 a.m. He always woke up. It might have been 1 a.m. 3 a.m. is kind of like a magic witching hour. I just meant in the middle of the night. Finally, he goes to a therapist. They start unpacking his family. He's like, I don't care about you. Tell me about everything you know about your family. They uncover that his uncle died when he was 18, the same age as this kid. His car broke down in, the, in a snowstorm, and he had to crawl. They found his body dead at 1 a.m. at the time he kept waking up, crawling away from the truck. So they think then, you know, his, that memory is in the genes, whatever gets passed through to him somehow. It's, it sounds like magic, but... They start working on that, and as soon as they uncovered that, he stopped doing it. He was able to sleep. Because he was waking up and going, don't fall asleep, don't fall asleep. If I fall asleep, I'll die. Which was the fear of his dead uncle that got like into the mix and handed down. So I've been doing that. I'm like, my parents were worried about money growing up. Like there was a lot of tension about money. I was like, oh yeah, I got that, I got that. And then I'm like, now I'm like, what the, what the fuck else do I have? Like, my mom is a refugee from World War II. She left Lithuania when she was seven because the Nazis were there. And yeah. I'm like, shit! You know what I mean? I'm like, no! that That's in me somewhere. And I have, like, a resting sort of, like, is anything coming to get me kind of feeling. And I'm like, I wonder how much of that you inherit from your folks. I know, right? Like, like my uh, growing up, my, my dad and my mom, they feared the El Cucuy. What's that? Which is the boogeyman. Oh, no. Don't they, say it two more times. <laughs> they always tell me this. Go to sleep or the, or the, or the, or go to sleep or the boogeyman is going to take you. I don't like this. Or um, or uh, make sure you cover up your your feet because um, the devil might come and grass snatch your feet. So you have to wear shoes? The devil no, sees you shoes? you have to cover up your feet oh, with your blanket. He's like, I'm not lifting a blanket. I'm and the devil. I got a lot of souls to torture. I can't be lifting up blankets, grabbing feet. If your feet are exposed, I grab them. And you know, there's kind of like a wisdom to that. It's probably like, I was just in Mexico. I got bit by a scorpion. Should have had the covers on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was in bed. 
pull the covers up. So there is a wisdom to that. And then it becomes like a story about the devil because that's more compelling, I guess. Yeah, the devil. <laughs> and I'm, 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 I, don't go to, I, I don't go to church that much, but I was born Catholic. Mm. And um, I don't practice Catholicism like I used to before. But it's still stuck in my head in the fear, like, like, uh, like during like um, Passover, during Lent, yeah. And I'm hanging out somewhere, I'm somewhere, and I don't, oh, I, I'm, dude. and I, I'm vegan, but I see somebody eating like pork or meat on on um, Good Friday, yeah. And I say, oh, something bad gonna happen to that motherfucker. Uh, yeah, dude, I used to <laughs> He's feel cursed when I was a teenager, <laughs> and I was hornier than anybody's ever been, and it was Easter Sunday. And all I wanted to do was jerk off. I was like, I can't. It's Easter. And of course, I still would. I just feel so bad about it. So you, you would give up masturbating for Lent? No, it's just I didn't want to jerk off on a holy day. Oh, yeah. Which is ridiculous. But it's there's almost like a, not a sexual fetish, but there's a fetish to it. It's like, I, I'm, I'm being naughty. You know what I mean? It feels kind of, let's put it this way. You're paranoid or you're afraid, but at least you're not bored. It's kind of fun to yeah. be like, don't do that. Don't do that. Like, that's bad luck. Black cat crosses your path. A slice of bread lands butter down. Whatever it is, it's fun to be like, because you feel so alive. You know what I'm saying? I never heard of that one, the uh, slice of bread falls down, butter down. They say the devil's near. I forget what, what tradition that's from. But if you have a buttered slice of toast and it falls and it lands butter down, that means the devil's near. And I'm like, or it just means your breakfast is ruined. I don't know why are we bringing a demon into this. <laughs> My dad will whip you with a belt if you drop that bit right with butt on the bottom. <laughs> He'd be mad? <laughs> Probably whip you with a belt. Were you, was that the situation? Yeah. I'm so sorry. My dad was one of those people that um, he'll, he'll whip with a belt. It's, it's, it's fucked weird, up. It's weird, man. It's fucked up. It's fucked up. I guess he would whip too, I guess, but he ended up, he ended up, he handed down that tradition. No, yeah, well, hurt people hurt people. You've heard that, right? I think that's, where does... That's one of Father Greg's biggest points to me is it's like, don't you see this is being handed down? There are no evil people. There's mentally unwell people. And mental, I, I'm working on a joke about this where I'm like, I think it's so funny that we think God is mad at us. Let's say I cheat on my wife. So God's mad at me, right? I'm bad. I did the wrong thing. But then I go out for a drink with you, not a drink. I don't drink either. But we go out and we have dinner. And I tell you that some flaw, something that happened in my childhood that made me afraid of closeness. Closeness actually means death. If I'm too close to somebody, I'm in danger because maybe I had a manipulative mother or maybe I had whatever it was. So of course, this pattern was established. If I get too close, I'll self-sabotage. I'll cheat on my wife. Now we're having dinner. You understand. You forgive me. You're my homie. You forgive me. You love me. Yeah. But God is mad at me? Like that is, that is like the most perverse way to look at the universe that you Felipe Esparza last comic standing winner can understand my predicament over a meal and your heart can be softened but we have this idea of a god that goes like yeah but you fuck somebody else like but no listen to what like you just did it with your dad your dad did this fucked up thing to you that fucked up thing happened to your dad that's the softening of compassion and understanding. I don't know if it's the Sufis, but there's a phrase, an all knowing God is an all forgiving God. But we don't even want that. We want heads to roll. We want people to get fucked up and build up walls and destroy our enemies and stuff. And I'm like, have the, the punchline is I go, so you, my, my friend Felipe will forgive me, but God won't. I'm like, have a God that's better than your friend Felipe, uh. right? But we don't, we have like a scary, scary God murdering, angry he's keeping a list he wants you to believe in him that's a trip too what kind of god cares if you believe in him i mean has anyone stopped to ask that question like if you made a simulation like you programmed a fake reality and you filled it with people and the people didn't believe in you as a programmer why would you why would you give a shit wouldn't you be impressed you're like i made such a good program they don't even know i exist they'd be like i'm i'm dope i made an atheist You'd be amazed. Why would you be mad at something you made for not knowing you existed? Like if that, if that was the game God was playing, then it, he would do dumb stuff like open the clouds and go like, don't forget, I'm real. If that's what really gets him off is being believed in, be more believable. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know. Like when people say like I'm atheist or whatever, 
or like like me, I don't go to church no more. Yeah, you don't care about God. I want you to throw that Bible to trash. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I didn't go to that part. It's superstition. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think about that all the time. You Let's take like a really hardcore materialist, which is a fancy word for someone who doesn't believe in anything. And I'm like, will you go in a room and throw 50 Bibles in a bonfire? Some people might, okay. Will you go in the most haunted house, the most consistent, like the comedy store is haunted. Go in the comedy store, spend the night there. We'll give you the names of the ghosts that are supposed to be there and just insult them all night alone. Just do that. Will you do that? Or will you like, will you let a witch doctor throw bones in the fire and take a, a garment of your clothes and put goat blood on it and look you in the eye and be like, I don't want that. I would, would I don't believe in that. But that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> let's put it to the test. You don't think curses are real. Let's get this fucking freaky, you know, bone necklace. Let's do the whole thing for a million dollars. Will you let this dude? Because here's the trip, dude. We're putting spells on each other all day, every day. In fact, I'm trying to put a spell on you right now. I'm trying to send you love. I'm trying to say you're welcome. You're good. That matters. The rest of your day, the, and therefore the rest of your life, will be different because you talked to me today and I talked to you. I used to think it was dumb to say, hey, have a good weekend. What control do I have over your weekend? A lot of fucking control. You know what I'm saying? You text me. I reply back, let's meet for coffee. And we do. Your whole life is different because we went for that coffee. Mm -hmm. I know we know this. It sounds like we're stoned, but it's like it brings such an urgency to every smile, to every stranger or every scowl. You're rude to the TSA. You just, you just put a curse on that person. I'm not saying you curse them. In fact, that could lead to a good thing because I'm an asshole to you. You see that now someone's kind. So we don't know what's for good or what's for evil, but everything really, really fucking matters. It's crazy. I say this all the time, but they did a study where they, people walk down a hall and they're introduced to certain words and then they leave. They think they're putting poems together with words. But the study was to see how fast they walk down the hall when they leave. And the group that got words like slow, lethargic, they walk slow. The group that got fast, quick, rapid, they walked fast. So like, think about that. I say patience to you. That, that ripples throughout you and then you're gonna drive home differently, maybe, just a little bit differently, because you'll go, what was it, patient, you know, something? This is why I'm trying to listen to Greg's books all the time, because I'm trying to get that in me, because somebody cuts me off, I honk at him, maybe he goes home, he's pissed off now, he goes home and yells at his kids, you know what I'm saying? Or maybe I don't honk at him, and he doesn't. We, we can't control it. Maybe if I had honked at him, he'd be like, oh, he's right, I'm an asshole, I won't yell at my kid. You know what I mean? Like, you don't know, but like, you might as well lean towards the light. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let's do some ketamine. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I remember um, I was at the Beverly Center with my friend, Ivan, and we were hanging around. I was just walking, and there was like a bunch of, um, I don't know, they must have been, I don't know, Wiggers, you know? <laughs> African-American, please. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, and they were just chilling, hanging out, and then we are just walking, and they started speaking to us like, what's up, Holmes? What's up, babe? You know, like <laughs> like they were in Father Greg's boiler book. Oh, you really? Know, talking like that, like they're from Mexico. Like, like they were Chicano, you know, that like they were cholos to us. <clears throat> and then my friends started playing around. Oh, man, what's up, Holmes? To that white dude. And I went like this, man, you know this? motherfuckers right now i changed the i changed everything you know these motherfuckers he goes no i'll fuck these fools you said all that four of them right fuck all four of these fools and then that guy said what and i said yeah fuck for all, all four of you guys i'm gonna come back with a bat if you guys are still here i'm gonna fuck you guys up you just didn't like that they were talking to us like that in that way in that manner knowing that i know they don't speak that way right so I thought they were making fun of us. I saw it right away that they were making fun of us. Oh. My friend didn't. So um, as soon as um, I, I said, I said, we went to our cars, and I always had bats in my car back in the day. <laughs> oh, I had no. a bat because in and in, in now late, if you have a bat in your car, and the police checks your car, they're gonna ask you why you have a bat, mm. and you have a, gotta have an answer for them. Yeah, but you have a bat, another bat, a glove, 
a, a score of a score a fake score of the yeah. last game. Couple caps, <laughs> catch your mask. Yeah, you have Tommy Lasorda inside the trunk. They know you're a baseball player. <laughs> they know you play baseball. You have one cleat in there. This is very good creative intelligence. So on, yeah. well, we took out those little bats, and um, we went out there. We chased them out of the Beverly Center. They were still there. Yeah, they. I told them to leave, and they 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 left. And then we went to go to the we went to go do other stuff for about an hour and a half. And I said, it goes, it goes by, my friend said, what are you doing? I gotta trade back to make sure these motherfuckers left. Or they're not still messing around here, acting stupid, <laughs> bothering people. So we went in. <laughs> we went in and they were like at um, Virgin Records, you know, or warehouse. That's how old the story is. And they were listening to music on headphones. The listening station. Yes, and then my friend saw one of the guys, and he tapped the window with a bat. Oh God! And he goes, "Get out!" Of here. And then they both ran, and I think they called the cops and the security. <laughs> so they were fake all along. Oh God! What made you think of that story? <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> About changing people. Yeah, that's another way to change. The, the rest of their lives was different. That's so funny because okay, so that seems like a parable. There's two dudes, two actually Latinx. People, you and your your friend, you both saw the same thing. He took it as these guys are trying to connect. You took it as they're making fun of me. That's one of the most interesting, like, screens we're looking at reality. Did you see the movie The Whale? Brendan Fraser? It's the, no. it's the one where he's got the big fat suit on. No, I didn't see it. It's it's okay. I'm not even he's saying you should dude, right? yeah, And yeah. he's gay too? Yeah, he's big and gay. A gay whale. He's a gay whale. Humpback. Did you know dork means whale dick? Yeah, it's in Britain, London, right? I didn't know that. I just found that out last night. What stoner, surfer, scientist, marine biologist was like, that's not a dick, that's a dork, dude. Look at that thing. Like He called it a dork. It's so close to dick. Yeah, when I saw that, when I read about the movie The Whale, and I saw that 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 it was that he was also obese and um, he was gay, it just made me too sad, you know. You didn't want to it. watch it. I remember feeling that way. Because I know my brother was gay growing up, and he had a hard time, you know. And oh yeah. And I didn't want to watch. I don't want to go through that. It's not like that. Oh no. Okay. No, he doesn't even leave the house, so nothing's happening. In terms, well, your brother was harassed and stuff. No. Yeah. Yeah. That sucks. See, this is what I was trying to get at. This sounds like tension. You joked about being tense about the spelling bee. Got a gay brother who's being harassed. You're getting beaten with a belt. Come on, Felipe, open up, man. This is your time. Ah. This is your time. Do your share. <laughs> Help people. That's what I want to joke about it. Now I try to like make draw light. My brother likes all my jokes, by the way. I make light into it. Oh, no, he was not gay. It's not his fault, you know. He was sucked into it, you know. <laughs> my brother when his and his partner when they hear when they would hear that joke, they would just go like this. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> So he's out now. It, it oh, worked my brother out. Was out, man. He was, he was out. Um, he was, yeah, he was out since, I guess, when we were teenagers. That's that's brave. I remember. Um, yeah, man, it was tough. Yeah, but he's handsome too. Yeah, he's not like like handsome. Like I remember doing a bit about it on my first bit. Cause my brother's gay, man. He's good looking. He can have any man he wants. <laughs> He wants a woman. <laughs> That's like having Superman powers. <laughs> but you wake up every morning, you tell yourself, I'm not going to rescue no one. Because <laughs> he's got Help! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you mean the falling people are women. Yeah. <laughs> Help! <laughs> and I remember my brother was dating somebody that was not good looking. And I would try to talk to him like a brother, you know, like a, like a guy talking to one of his best buddies. Like you, bro. You could do better. <laughs> I'm only saying this because that's the kind of, you know, because I'm an ugly guy. That's something I will pick up. <laughs> but, bro, you could do better. Challenge yourself. <laughs> You're not applying yourself. <laughs> and um, I remember, like, hanging out with my brother and then hot chicks would look at him and all women. Oh, he he's he's so hot. And I'm but they're cock blocking. Yeah, he's gay though. He's gay. <laughs> what a waste. And I said, I'm not gay. What a shame. 
<laughs> You're trying to sco- scoop in. Scoop, scoop in, in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's like Ricky Martin. I mean, women love gay men. I think Ricky Martin is gay? Yeah, dude. Wow, I didn't know that. You were today days old. I didn't know that. I thought he was one of those people that never, was never going to share his sexuality with people. Is that out? I'm checking. That's got to be I'm out. That's out. Really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Enrique Iglesias is straight. The, the the comedian the no not Enrique the 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 Hawaiian not Gabriel t-shirts? Iglesias Gabriel the, the movie the world about him <laughs> I I didn't laugh at oh. that <laughs> no I'm talking about Enrique Iglesias oh he's no a, way he's no he's straight oh he's straight okay. I'm saying he's straight because dad saying. was like who, Enrique Iglesias right or Julio yeah Iglesias. yeah Julio Iglesias Julio Iglesias to all the girls of love before yeah he's a real yeah, that was a ballet, right? Humid. He in the sang room. with um, Willie Nelson. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So okay. By la mort. Were there? Do they take control? That's Enrique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take care. They're the same mold. Mamma mia. Yeah, they got the he got same mold. He got his mold removed. I know. And I bought it off eBay. <laughs> <laughs> Grand switches. It cost me five hundred pesos. <laughs> It's like people that buy Napoleon's dick. They buy it? Somebody said the surgeon cut Napoleon's dick off when they were uh, doing his autopsy. The third leg or what? Yeah, I don't think it was very big. Oh. Sorry, Napoleon. Sorry, Napoleon. They're sad. Um, I was doing a cruise ship with Burt Kreischer. Okay. The It was called um, Burt Kreischer at Sea. Yeah. With a bunch of other comedians I met, like Mark Norman and... Like, yeah, and like, hey, man, yeah. this is what happened yesterday. Was uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's it? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's so it. Wow, well, he's and, great. Uh, he's, he's great. Awesome. There was a, a sp- I was a judge of a speedo contest with Miss Pat <laughs> and a uh, big Jake Okerson and I think Mark Norman too, and. Burt Kreischer was sober, October, sober, everything. But when he got to that ship, he started. He, t- he took his first drink. And after that, he just started drinking through the whole ship. <laughs> and it was a speedo contest that turned into the smallest man contest. Smallest immediately. wiener. Let's see the smallest wiener. The smallest wiener. Oh, wow. So and then it was like, show your cock. And <laughs> this guy took out his penis and it was small, bro. It was like <laughs> stop, bro. It was like the the, the no great t- no that, that that right there. That's man. a micro. Yeah, and that came in second. I like that you look. That came in second place, by the way. Burt Kreischer said, "Can anybody beat this?" I'll give you five grand. And Burt Kreischer's shirt was already off. Or, you know, it was yeah. on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? His wife was already getting the check ready, you know? And the way I was in the back, I was a, I was a contestant still for the regular Speedo contest. Yeah. And I said, I'm, and you, you don't want to get on this, man? And there was this woman, and she was rubbing her husband's shoulders. Ryan, you got this. Shut the fuck. I don't know what his name. It could have been Austin. It was a white name. Shut. Montgomery. She was. Page. She knew. Yeah. She knew. Come she on, goes, sweetie. You need- got this. <laughs> you got this. Honey, Calm down. You got this. Calm as go do in the pool. Do not get hard. Go right in the now. pool. You got yeah. this. Get in the cold pool and show it. Did he do it? Man, he put it. He put it. Took it off and flashed it right in front of his Pat. Oh my and God. she said that if you. If, in order to go down on it, first you gotta open it like a clitoris, and open it and shape and shape it, bro. He, and this guy, his his um, he was his tattoos Stop in it. the back. His all his tattoos did not match that penis. The penis energy because he had tanks and American Eagle. A big bl- the Goodyear blimp is on his yeah, chest. Yeah, fireworks, bro. <laughs> Oh, America, the beautiful. Those type of tattoos, you know? Like, I'm not going to wear a mask. You know, but, uh, yeah. Maybe I shouldn't have said that I'm not going to wear a mask part, but, yeah, I was a proud American. (laughs) Oh, no. And he got it. He won the, but then, 
Bert said the guy's got to split it, so he got twenty five hundred with the other guy because they were so similar. That but sucks. that guy won, though. He really won. But look, if your wife clearly you don't want to do it, and Bert's like you're gonna get five grand, and you go up and do the scariest thing you've ever done in your life, which is let your worst dream come true and let everyone laugh. Miss Pat is gonna roast your your micro penis. You should get five grand. Then um, Big J wrote to him too because he had like this big scar, I guess, from or from his past, I guess. Yeah. And then Jay say something like, Jake say something about, like, I wonder what how smaller it was before the axe wound. <laughs> oh God, man! And this is not like we were like only like three hours into the trip. And this guy's like, gonna be on the boat the rest of the yeah, time. Yeah, I could still. I was still waving at Cubans at um, La Carreta restaurant in Miami, bro. <laughs> like that's how close we were to the to the to the shore. <laughs> Like, You're not even in international waters. I'm not this, even international this was waters. Good yet. old effect, American fun, as the tattoos would appreciate. Yes. Then we still had like four more days of travel. Wow. If you open with a micro penis competition, where do you go from there? What's day four? Belly flop content with no clothes on. Okay. I don't like that. I'm not doing that. This sounds a little bit like there was that episode of The Simpsons where Mr. Burns hires Homer to just humiliate himself. He just gives him money. I'm like, this sounds a lot like that. It's like, just go hurt yourself. <laughs> it was wild, man. There was a guy that was at the at the speedo contest who was wearing that um, Borak bathing suit. Oh, sure. And oh, he then, came prepared. So it was announced ahead of time this would be happening. Yeah, it was a bathing. It was a bikini contest, like a speedo contest. But then later on that night, we're having like the this crazy karaoke party where everybody's singing. It was totally fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, this guy was, Bert was buzzed and he was singing, Can you take me higher? <laughs> to the place where and he's killing it. But then I see the guy. From the Speedo contest, cheering him on, wearing the same Borat. Speedo from the morning, bro. Oh. So now we're like 12 hours in, he's still wearing the same Speedo. And I'm bored, you know, I'm not drinking. I'm trying to find stains on it, you know, maybe. <laughs> oh, no. My wife would point at it, ah, that's the guy who didn't even win. <laughs> he kept it on. I don't like this. I don't like this. So you're sober. And you're a vegan, and you're going on booze cruises. How's that? Well, I lost a lot of weight on that shit, bro, not eating. Yeah, right? Yeah. I don't think they had, like, a good vegan. Not, like, not that many vegan, vegan options. So when we got to the Bahamas, my wife and I, we ran to a Burger King because I know they have veggie patties there. There you go. <laughs> Why did you become a vegan? I was doing the Atkins diet. Yeah. Back in the day, when, when I was touring with another comic, we were all doing it, Yeah, a bunch of comics. But I was doing it the wrong way. I was only eating cheese and beef all yeah. day. Yeah. No salads, also no water. Oh, God. And no, just Diet Cokes. Oh, no. So Diet Coke. Um, and Felipe. Just patties and cheese, bro. Oh. And I, I was like constipated for five days. I don't like this. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, man. I must have ripped my colon when I finally went to the bathroom. That's what they mean by have it your way. Yes. <laughs> it, I, I need, it came out with no secret sauce. Oh, God. It was bad, man. And I said, forget this. No more meat. I blame it on meat. Yeah. So, and so no I just fiber. Stopped, There's no and fiber. And I stopped eating beef, beef and I started eating cheese for two weeks straight. I was just eating whatever that whatever is not beef, whatever is in cheese. Like no milk either. Just rice and beans and vegetables. Yeah. So I just kept eating that. And I went to the restroom and I pooped and it was black. Like old I, stuff. And I had to go look to make sure I wasn't dying, you know? Yeah. And it was like a big piece of it looked like li like liver. It was black. And I have to Google it right away, man. What the fuck is going on? And then the, that was all my toxins leaving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, you, you had a lot of bad stuff going on. And there. also during my, um, during the time when I had 
when I was constipated, I had a hemorrhoid for the first time. I never had one in my life. And people ask me, I was like, what do they feel like? It feels like you're sleeping and you're being raped by a, a ghost that used to be a prison inmate every night. Like every night, that ghost pulls down your trousers and has it his way. <laughs> has it your way. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and oh God. The next day, man, wearing the ki- wearing the Burger King hat too. <laughs> oh God! Because it's his birthday. Yeah, every day. The next day, I was just so sore, man. I felt like I was sodomized. I felt like I was attacked, and I didn't know what was going on. So I kept it quiet, you know. And who are you gonna tell this to? Yeah, and like, yeah, you can't tell that to another comic or friend of your age, bro. Your ass hurts too, bro. Why are you telling me this? <laughs> Go talk to a doctor. This Google is the it. First, you're the first ass vegan I've ever met. It was all butt. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? Man. <laughs> so then after, then my wife, she was raised vegan in Ohio with her mother. In Ohio? Wow. Yeah. I just say that because when I think of the heartland, I'm like, that's so I much know, dairy. Man. How, did, how did a woman raise three kids vegan in Ohio? Wow. That's commitment. So she had something to do with it. You became yes. vegan after she... She was were... vegetarian. She was vegan vegetarian when I met her. But me, I'm all bad. Like I told her, like, I know you're vegan. I know you're vegan, and you grew up eating not eating meat. But this is LA, man. You never had a a spicy chicken sandwich on Jack in the Box at two in the morning with jalapeno <laughs> poppers on the side and grilled and cheese sticks on top of your hood. Yes. And then she said, Nah. So then I got her into eating um, chicken from Jack in the Box. <laughs> oh, you turned her. Yeah. But she was already eating it, but not at all. I never see, and not like real good stuff like Jack in the Box. Yeah. Jack in the Crack? Jack in the Crack, man. <laughs> Two in the morning, number five. But you're sober. What are you doing at Jack in the Box at five in the morning? But that was back then, man. Oh, you weren't sober yet? No, I was just, no, I wasn't, I wasn't drinking, but um, I was doing a lot of late shows, hanging out late. Yeah. And Jack in the Box is always open. Well, you mentioned that. What did you get into? In the drugs, crack. I love crack. You love crack. <laughs> how yeah. Did, how did that come about? Who oh, gave you crack? My neighbor. My brother had just been shot. Like he was shot by the police. The same brother we were talking about. Yeah. Oh no. No, another brother. My brother. That brother. My other brother, not gay. He's good looking. Yeah. Um, my brother was shot by the police. What was he doing? What What happened? Oh, being bad. He was being bad. I didn't mean to imply that he was he deserved to be shot. Yeah, he but what happened? To be shot. Oh no, uh, no, 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 no. I mean what's happening? What was going on? It's funny, man, like when people like I know like Black Lives Matter, right? And you know, black people get shot and they they protest police reform and Mexican people we get shot too, you know, like Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans in New York. Latinos, we get shot too, you know. But at the end of the day, man, you know, we want to protest and get mad, but we don't want to get involved. <laughs> like at the end of the day, we 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 look, we, 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 we think about it. Go, I gotta be at work tomorrow morning. I work with a lot of white people, you know. It's a hassle. It's a hassle, you know. You're we start saying it's about a hassle. The hassle. You're the first ass vegan I've met and the first hassle non activist. <laughs> like, I, and I also, can't, like, I can't. when Latinos get shot, we try to find out what really happened, you know, mm. the whole story, not the social media story. And then we find out the cop was actually a Mexican too, so he shot another Mexican and <laughs> it kind of makes it all right. You know, he got shot by our own people. No. You know, it was Raza again, Raza, homie. No. Like when, no. my, like when my brother was shot, like nobody, no one came up to us and said, yeah, I gotta sue the cops. You gotta, gotta, you gotta come down in the city. Right. But isn't that just institution, like you've been pushed down so hard, it's not even an option? Isn't that a tragedy? My, my, my mom were, they were like, my mom was afraid that the cops were gonna come to our house and start questioning us. And then everybody's gonna see the cops in our house. And bring shame to our house. Right. Because I grew up in a neighborhood, like, if the cops go to your house, it's over. Like, you guys are losers. 
<laughs> or you're a loser. You're like, why is the cop in your house? Like, you're going to lose your immigrant status now. You can't get a green card now. Well, it's crazy. I don't know. if Did you watch the telemarketer thing on Max? Yeah, I loved it. it wasn't it good? But remember, they targeted immigrants because they would call and say, well, you donate and you get this sticker. And you have a lot of illegals that are donating their money to get a sticker that doesn't mean shit because people are exploiting the fear of, of being an illegal immigrant. You know what I'm saying? So there's something similar going on here. It's like the oppression continues because there's this fear of like getting getting deported, right? Mm -hmm. But just because you came into the country that way doesn't mean I don't have to tell you this. It's like that still fucking but, sucks. But somebody like that, like who is proud to live in America, and he's an immigrant, and he's going to work every day, and you tell him, "Hey, man, you want to support the cops?" See, of course, it's part of it's part of my neighborhood. Right? How much we're gonna sell this sticker? Just put in the back of your station wagon. Sure, how much? 20? Let me get two. Yeah. And then it makes him feel like... No, it's I get fooling it. us to make it feel we're more American. No, I get it. That's what I mean. It's it's exploiting. Uh, you want to belong. You want to show yeah. that you're there. I get it. But, I'm, I come from a, uh, but I come from a neighborhood where for us, you know, when 9-11 happened, a lot of people in my neighborhood had... Go USA bumper stickers. Yeah, USA I, it, number one. It made me think of the American flags. But yeah, they they rather put the Go USA, but not pay for their tags. Yeah, right. That the tag might be expired. Right, right, right. But go America. Right, right. The tag is another kind of donation to the government. <laughs> it is another way to support the police. I remember when my tags were expired, <laughs> my neighbor, my landlord, who was paying uh, rent to. Oh, he's Salvadorian. Hijo de la gran puta, cerote. Me le que tres el tag. Anyway, that fool said, he saw my tag was expired. Yeah. And he goes, if you want a, if you want one, I got an extra one. I'll sell it to you. He said, for how much? 25 bucks. Wow. 25 dollars cerote. Anyway, so he wanted to sell me a tag, an, uh, an extra tag. To yeah, a, yeah, yeah. The one and, for the, yeah, and did and you? And he goes, hell no. Oh, uh, hell no, man. I'm mean, like, I'd rather drive with expired tags than fake tags. Yeah, right? <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. I drove to Las Vegas one time with, to do a show because I needed the money. Of course, I needed the money. And um, I, I just said, yes, I'll do it. And I'm not, not knowing that I have a bad car and all that. Mm. And I said, I guess I'll do it. I said, I'll do it. And man, like, you know, people talk about like, oh man, this guy, he climbed Mount Everest. You know, he climbed Mount Everest. This guy, um, he does jujitsu because his nose broken. You know, this guy goes into this ice chamber like Joe Rogan and mm. gets all frozen. Nah, man, you want a real challenge? Drive to Las Vegas to do a gig for $200. In a bad car. With a bad car with expired tags. <laughs> And no driver license and child support coming after you. Stop. <laughs> That's your Iron Man challenge. That's my Iron Man, yeah. Holmes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you make it? I made it, man. Where are you at now? I but mean, the second gig, the second yeah. time they charge, they 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 get, they book me. I said, I'll take the bus. I took a Greyhound bus. Yeah, no, that that might be better. <laughs> the gas to get to LA from LA to Vegas has got to be. At least a hundred bucks. Yeah, I lost a lot of money in that gig. I hate this story. I want. I want more. I want more. I lost. Man, what time? I, I did the math. I made like thirty five dollars. I can't. You could have made more selling your fake tags. I could have made home made more money staying at home. Pardon the interruption, weirdos. This episode is brought to us by our friends at Armra. You guys know I am obsessed with ways to strengthen my immunity, my gut health, as well as my fitness, endurance, and my metabolism, as well as my hair and my skin's radiance. And I recently discovered one product that does all of that, and it couldn't be easier to incorporate into my life. I'm talking about Armra Colostrum. Colostrum is one of those things that keeps coming up in conversation with my friends. What is it? Colostrum is the first nutrition we receive 
human life and contains all of the essential nutrients our bodies need to thrive. I'm talking about reactivating hair growth and glowing skin by reducing inflammation and puffiness in your face and neck, as well as stimulating stem cells to produce collagen and increase elasticity. I'm talking about igniting your metabolism and fortifying gut health so you feel less bloated and lighter in general while replenishing your microbiome, stabilizing blood sugar, and accelerating fat burning, as well as fueling your fitness performance and your recovery. Arma Colostrum is a proprietary concentrate of bovine colostrum that harnesses over 400 living bioactive nutrients that rebuild the barriers of your body and fuel cellular health for a host of research-backed health benefits. It's wholly natural, sustainable, and it was developed with the highest integrity, talking about grass-fed in the United States, and they guaranteed the highest potency and bioavailability of any colostrum on the market for results that you can actually see and feel, and I can attest to that. I add it to my smoothie. You don't even notice, but you notice the feeling, meaning you don't notice it in the smoothie, but the, the results are Palpable. So we've worked out a special offer for weirdos. Receive 15% off your first order. Go to tryarmra.com slash weird or enter weird to get 15% off your first order. That's T-R-Y-A-R-M-R-A.com slash weird. We're also brought to us by our friends. Of course I'm wearing them, YouTubies. The Perfect Gene. Guys, I love the Perfect Gene in a nutshell. It's a stretchy gene that no one needs to know, meaning it looks as good as any designer gene that I've paid way too much for. I've worn it to movie premieres. I've worn it on late night. I never don't wear them, but the secret is 2% spandex and 2.5% rayon for extra comfort, meaning they're as comfortable as pajama pants. In fact, I have slept in them. They are that comfortable. They're also the best looking. I love the dyes. I love the colors. They have a new khaki dye that I really, really love. I'm wearing this uh, very dark sort of midnight blue one, which goes with everything. They're also incredibly, incredibly well made. I never have to replace them. They don't tear. They don't rip. Things don't pop off. They are awesome, high-end, maximum durable, and they spare your nuts because they give you that stretch you need for that comfort in your man zone. So your nuts ain't crushed, whether you're working with a lemon or a lentil, a three leaf clover, a big old hunk, an eggplant, the perfect gene has you covered. I absolutely love them. They also have incredible t-shirts. Just check them out. It's a great company and a great product and everything they make is so, so comfortable and looks incredible. Theperfectgene.nyc, that's www.theperfectgean.nyc. Did I say that? Theperfectgene.nyc. Use code WEIRDO for 20% off at checkout. That's a great discount. WEIRDO at checkout for 20% off. All right, back to Felipe. Okay, that's that brings us now. You won last comic standing. You're wearing a, a tracksuit yeah. with matching Adidas. Where are you at now? Are you a little more comfortable than you've been in your life? Yes, I'm I'm very I'm more comfortable now. And um, what, I signed with um Judy Brown Judy Marmel. Judy Brown Marmel. Okay. Levity. Sure. And um I'm with um UTA. And they're working yet? Yes. Well, how's your life changed? And and in what ways did it not change? Man, when I won Last Comic Standing, $250,000, my son's mom filed for child support the next day. She was and, watching. Yeah, she became the last <laughs> baby mama standing. She's, she ended up, I had two kids from her, so they're all grown. So she got like a fat check, you know? Sure. And and all the kids were it's like she won. So she won. Yeah, man. she won. She became the last baby mama standing. <laughs> how much? How much of it? I think like a, over a hundred thousand. Because that's got to be most of what you got. Yeah. Minus taxes. Plus taxes. Reps. And um, you made thirty five dollars again. <laughs> thirty five dollars, man. But you know what? I went, when I won last comic standing, I didn't know how much. I didn't know that I had debts mm. and unpaid tickets. It they all, all shows came up. at once. Yeah. Like I remember. When I was living by myself in um, Elysian Valley, Frogtown, mm. I used to live next to um, this actor named Emilio Rivera from Sons of Anarchy. Um, forgot my point now. 
You didn't know you got all your debts came at the same time your tickets. Yes. So I moved in by myself to a little, a place this small. The size of the studio. The size of this. Like the, if you cut it out, my kitchen was like this hallway. And yeah. The rest, the rest of the bedroom. It was this small. Hmm. And um, I bought, a, uh, I bought uh, everything on credit from Montgomery Ward. Hmm. That's how long it was. Or I bought a washing, I bought a, a oven, a refrigerator. Then I started, I didn't have money to pay for all that stuff, so I never paid them. Mm. I know that the company doesn't even exist anymore. Somehow, somebody loser bought that debt years ago and not ready to collect it. Oh my God. And then my friend. Be, uh, this is after you won. That's so what then, I won. then this defunct company guy shows up looking for it. Yes. And then my friend, who when I, when I used to have a car, I remember that he got into a car accident and they towed the car. Mm. And the tow truck, tow truck place, they wanted money for having my car there over the, all those years that I never picked it up. Wow. I didn't even know that it, that car. I thought it would just keep it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I yeah. Took, I ended up, yeah, I ended up $35. <laughs> At the end of the day, I, I was debt free. I didn't owe anybody. I didn't owe child support. I didn't owe anybody. Oh, and I donated. Money to the um, homeboy industry. When I was on our last comic standing, they were asking all the comics, if you win, what are you going to do with that money? This person said, I'm going to buy a car. I'm going to buy a house. I said, um, I'm going to donate some of my money to Father Greg Boyle and the homeboy industry. Yeah. Because if, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here today. And at the same time, Father Greg Boyle was close to losing everything because mm. the donation were not coming in. Mm. So me saying that on television was like a big commercial for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everyone started donating. Oh, that's awesome. So I've, I've donated over like a lot of money. Like I donated 10 grand, 15 grand wow. of my winnings and I've donated like close to that every year. Wow. Good for yeah. you, man. Well, here we are again. I hope people donate. Whenever... Whenever I and can, they my park in the neighborhood. They still take my car. No, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I one last come and stand in. I had a, a homeboy that I grew up with that helped me terrorize somebody back in the days, and he wanted to get paid for that now. Even this, they're coming and invoicing you. Did he give you a, a printout? Yeah, I remember that one time <laughs> I helped you beat up this guy that that jumped you. I want ten G's for that. Wow. He even had a. He wrote it out. He did not write nah. it out. That would be great. With a bunch of dots, $10,000. So the money go went away fast. Good for you for still donating to Homeboy, even I, you know, after I, you found out so much of it wasn't coming I, to you. I remember like when I was last coming standing, a lot of people were saying, oh, this guy can't even talk right. He stutters. You know, he talks weird. And then like, all right, I'll get back at you guys. I donated money to this speech impairment school too. <laughs> you did? I sent him a big f -f 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 fat check check. <laughs> I used to have a, like a speech impairment growing up. Mm. But um, when you're growing up in a bad neighborhood and your mom's, you know, they don't know about stuff like that, they just beat you to talk right. Wow. Talk right! That's what my favorite episode of um, of um, Bugs Bunny is Porky Pig. Yeah, sure. When he was in the a, in a, in a army, it's an army episode, and they tell him to write your name on the wall. And he started writing a bunch of P's all over the chalkboard. He even stutters when he writes. Oh, no. Puck porky. My dad would make fun of me and say, I talk like a machine gun. Wow. Yeah. How'd that go away? I'm just talking. I mean, I remember one time I met this comedian, and he was telling me that I used to talk like you, bro. What I, my, he goes, my father, no, my mother, or his, I don't know, his uncle or somebody, he got me and he, he shoved a bunch of toilet paper in my mouth and made me talk like that all day. This is not the medically approved strategy. <laughs> so I'm thinking, but, but I didn't think about it that they were abusing this kid growing up, right? Yeah. And he, now he's giving horrible advice now. <laughs> so Heard people trying I to would, help um, people. I would put a, and then I would put a bunch of um, paper towels on my cheeks, so I could be like the, like Robert De, um, De Niro, what's his name, Marlon Brando in The Godfather. Yeah. 
you come here on the day of my daughter quinceañera you know so i started like pretending to oh talk oh my god and hey, you did it you tried I, it i tried it i thought it was stupid for a while but did it work no <laughs> And then my my ex manager she she took me to a, like a speech place yeah and then she was she was telling me like I don't know if she was attracted to me or something she goes I love your accent you shouldn't even take this class I don't know why your manager's paying for this he goes people need to hear that voice oh nice and that's how you met your wife and she bought you that tracksuit yeah she did man <laughs> yes she she did <laughs> so then most of the money went away do you want another one no I'm good. You sure? Yeah, I'm good. Do you feel it? I don't know if I feel it or not. It's hard to know sometimes. Does it make you hyper? No, because it calms you down and it picks you up. I love it. Mm. It's hard. Maybe sometimes people, it builds. It builds. Now that after you won, did that, more money came in there, like more success? Did it lead to more success or were you a little disappointed? Yeah, it led to more success. I started like, I went on tour with the last, last common standing comedians. Uh -huh. 85 city tour isn't that in the contract yeah but don't they they take a pretty big bite of that yeah yeah we're not making a lot of money well i was making more money than the other comics so i was happy right i was more money than i was making any anywhere so right and i got to meet i got to travel to, to places i only heard in music but did you have the problem that people that do the last comic had where it's like i just did all my material on tv Oh, no, man. I had a lot of material. Oh, really? Because I started doing stand-up comedy like in 94. So you had all this stuff. Yeah. I've just talked to some guys that were like, I won, and now I have to do it. Yeah, man. I, I would see Roy Woods Jr. and um, the other comedians. They're like grinding, man, writing jokes. Yeah. Going back and forth. My wife and I, man, we were like a comedy team. By the time I, I, I would do my three minutes. My wife would give me a, a list of the next three jo three minutes to do, and really? I would just do it again. If the show would have went on another 10 weeks, I think I would have had another three minutes for each week. Wow. That's really hard. Having an opener and a closer in three minutes is really hard. Because um, I, I, um, I have all my sets recorded, like on, t on little cassettes, mm. and I have all my sets recorded on my phone, too. So you would listen to them? I, li I listen to them every day. Every day? Every day. Like, I, if I did a show, I did a show recently, two weeks ago in, in Rotterdam, mm -hmm. Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Holland. Yeah, okay. And I did a show there, it was like an hour, hmm. and, I, and I went to go listen. I listened to it my whole trip when I was in Europe. Hmm. Must have listened to it like five times. What? I have such a hard time listening to myself. I'm really impressed that you have that discipline. I listen to it because I don't want to write it. You know, I don't oh, want to write want it to down. I want to memorize it by listening to it. So, and then when I memorize it, if I if I come up with a new tag while I'm listening to it, I write the whole sentence down. Yeah. Then I save it, and then I want to go use it somewhere else. Wow. Like when I I want to go see, I wrote, I wrote a joke. I want to go see that band, the English Beat. Uh. -uh. I don't know. They have that song. Um, uh, other songs are in movies now. They're like, they've been touring. The guy said he was touring now for 45 years. Wow. The English B, they have that song. They're ska. Mirror in the bathroom, please talk free. The door is open, just use your key. Can you take me to a restaurant and got glass tables? You can watch yourself while you are eating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm skanking. Yeah, and um, so it was a small venue, bro. Like, small. Like they were opening up, and, they, and then I thought I would joke, "Wow, man, I'm at the age now where I could watch all my bands together at Six Flags." Because <laughs> <laughs> before it'd be like this summer, Los Angeles Coliseum, Iron Maiden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, man, included with your ticket at Six Flags, Iron Maiden, hosted by Dean Del Rey. <laughs> And the Hellraisers. You know, because I have a metal podcaster. Ah, I know Dean Del Rey. Yeah, and then you could be like, you know what? I'm not even going to buy a ticket. I know Dean Del Rey. Let me open, dog. <laughs> oh, my God. Let me give you a ride there. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it for the ride. You let me in for the ride. That, so then after that 85 City Tour, <clears throat> things have continued to grow. I mean, you're touring with Bert. You're headlining. Yeah. You Touring with Betty Griffin too. 
Who, with Eddie. And I toured with Mike Epps. Yeah. These are great guys. He took me along. Mike Epps was crazy, man. He's like a big child. Mike? Do these guys give you any good advice, any lines that stuck with you? Did they shape you, push you, how to play a bigger room, whatever it might have been? Only from, um, man, Ricky Smiley. Mm. I don't know if you know him. I don't know if I know him. He's um he's a he's a legend. This guy is so funny. Like, this guy could um he could grab this paper, this book cube and and just look and go, modern mammals. And just him saying that, it everybody made you laugh. started laughing. Yeah, yeah. Just a funny person. And uh, he's funny. And I never seen anybody get a standing ovation. In between sets while hosting. Wow. That's incredible. I've never seen that. Yeah. And I, and I go, wow. I go, and I'm going up first, right? And this guy is like, if I felt like Dewey Cox. In yeah. that movie, Dewey yeah. Cox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When um, Elvis Presley just got off. Yes. Did you have to um, take it all, Mr. Presley? Yes, yes. So um, he, he, he does his set. Roaring, right? Everybody knows who he is, obviously. And I'm the first comic. And then um, he puts up a, a, a local guy, a, a guy that's who's local to the area, and it's Mike Epps' friend. And that guy destroys too, mm. destroys. And then he then uh, he does another five minutes after him. Then I'm, it's my turn. He brings he does this song that I never heard of, because and I know hip hop. But I never heard of this song. And I guess this song is hot, was hot back then. And man, I never, oh my God, like the whole audience, the, everybody, the 7,000 people. The song was killing. The song, 7,000 people rose up and waved like this with him. It was that song, Bone Crusher. Okay. Well, I'm out in the club and you think I'm a thug. <laughs> So I go to my car and I take up my nine, and then the, the 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 hook shows up. I tell you, I would never stop. I would never stop. And then, dude, he has everybody going. All right, man, y'all ready for your next comedian? Now they have to fade the yeah. song that they're all loving. Now interrupting your favorite song, Felipe Esparza. This is a nightmare. What you're telling me is elevating my heart rate. Like I'm nervous. So I, I told her I went back to teach. I went back to the song game. I changed my song <laughs> after the show. Changed that pussy ass song. I was gonna go up to. <laughs> oh, before you went out. Yeah, I was gonna go something that would have just burp. I said, just go up there and just put um, kiss me. Put a <laughs> Cypress Hill, um, instant in a membrane. Yeah, there you go. I have long hair. Yeah, there you go. So I could just go up there as I. Said, Hot looking guy that they never seen before. Yes, and how'd it go? It went good. It went good, man. Right off the bat. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Because they, they went like this. Uh, I wouldn't go. But then, but then they, they play the the song. But then it, they stop it like a regular DJ stop that song. Bah, 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 bah. So then I gotta go up there, man, and I could feel like, like, confidence that I don't have. You know, yeah. You know, this it is... felt like hosting the Golden Globes, bro. Like, yeah, I'm not getting nothing. You know, nothing. <laughs> I'm gonna start blaming people. Why did my agent book me here? You know, why did my agent book me? You Dude, know, we just watched that before you got here. <laughs> you know, it's just I tough. I... Like, I, 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 I felt unprepared. You know, like, yeah. I was booked ten minutes before this, <laughs> ten minutes ago, not ten days. You know. <laughs> I, I felt the pain, you know. I felt I feel I feel all the comics pain. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's something the comedian, no matter who you are, if you're telling me a story about somebody bombing or somebody not having a good time on stage. Oh no, I know, brother. Katie told me, "Did you watch the Globes?" And then I watched it, and I was watching it from a, a very sympathetic place. Oh, me too. You know what I mean? I wasn't like, <laughs> I've never done that. I, I laughed at the jokes, some of the jokes. And I, and I, but I was also looking around to see why, why, what's going on here. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I also didn't think it was that bad. And I'm not just saying that. No. When the headline says Joe Coy bombs, I'm clicking it, which, which is what it is. It's clickbait. Yeah. Then I watch the guy doing his job. Yeah, no, you guys don't know what bombing is, obviously. You don't. That's, thank you. That's it. You don't know what bombing is. Bombing is. Bombing is sweat. 
But I mean, when you're up there trying to work that joke out, and then you see your wife or somebody, she's flirting with the last comic who killed. <laughs> That's bombing. And she's still laughing at his jokes. Yes. If he you was can hear bombing, your wife laughing while you're up there struggling. Yes. If you're bombing, you can hear their tongue. It's so dry. It's flopping in this cavern. It's it's a, the loneliest, emptiest, nastiest. And he and he said, I didn't write these jokes. That's called a save line. Save line. He's trying to make you laugh by doing something you're not supposed to do. He's not actually going, ah, these fucking writers. These guys suck. Yeah, I fired him after this. Yeah, it's it's like old show business. It's like, folks, I didn't write this. I'm doing my best. You know, because you're out there. I remember I had to do a, a a roast with this comedian, very funny comedian. I'm Ada Rodriguez. We're doing like a a host of a wedding party. Mm. We're going to roast them. And I remember they wrote all these jokes plus our jokes for the roast. Was this filmed? It was filmed. It aired one time. And it, Patrice wasn't there, was he? No. Because I know a story about Patrice doing something like but this. But not that one. But the the producers of our show was a producer of the Big J show. Oh, okay. Zoo, Zoo, uh, Zoo, yeah. Zoolan or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Ben Stiller. So they fucking, uh, not, not, not Zoolan in the I movie. Know. That'd be cool, though. And, uh, <laughs> the Blue Steel Production Company. And I, know. Then I was reading the jokes. I didn't want to like talk bad, say like these jokes are horrible. These jokes are never going to work. Right. I just I looked around in the ride and I said, how many times am I allowed to say I didn't write this stuff? Yeah, that's right. And I was joking with the writer. Yeah, and then yeah, we yeah. all laughed. and yeah. We threw everything away and started writing more jokes. Yeah. But I know that that's coming from, well, I'm, I'm going to make my, my, my writers laugh at least. I hear that. And also, I love that story because if the jokes aren't working, somebody, I forget who told me this, somebody told me that it was Judd, Judd Apatow. He was like, the writers aren't there to write you a joke. They're there to say something to you that makes you think of a joke. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes it's ready to go. Just perfect. Oh, thank you. I can do this joke. But we did that on Crashing all the time. And I used to get frustrated, never mad, just like, alone in my trailer looking at it and I'm like my feeling would always be like you go out there and say this say these words I want you to do it because that 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 was my fear speaking I never said that to anybody but then I realized like no it's true they would write this joke maybe it was in their voice it would work for them and then I it was still my job to turn it into my voice you know what I mean it's not done it's not Amazon Prime like the joke shows up they say something, it makes you think of something. Like, I love that story. There's a story on Mr. Show where Brian Posehn pitched something terrible. And it was, it was supposedly so bad, everyone laughed and made fun of him. And then Bob Odenkirk was like, no, you're a funny guy. Let's unpack that. Like, that, it doesn't work now, but something about that made you laugh. Let's find it. And they reworked it, and it turned into one of their best sketches. So that's what I like about you. You're like, look, we're all in this together. This isn't there yet. Let's laugh at it. Let's let's call it out. I don't want to pretend like this is ready, but then you you build up a camaraderie and then you fix it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I love that. So I oh I had like nine other things to ask you, and now it's my turn, and I, don't, I just don't have it. I'm just kidding. How many times have you ever almost died? Died how? Like dead? Oh, on stage. I you could tell me a bomb story too, because that's on my mind too. Oh man, how'd that roast go? Did it go okay? What rose? The the wedding party. Oh, it went well. Yeah, but I thought was, maybe you were leading to a bomb. But it was like drama because we're we're she's hanging around she's hanging out with all the bridesmaids. Yeah, and trying to get like trying to get inside stuff of them to get to know them and then roast them later. Yeah, and I'm getting, hanging around with the males, right? And then we switch. Like I go, I do, I do, um. I do um, bachelor bridesmaid stuff. We get our feet done with them. <laughs> and we're talking. I'm getting my nails done. Um, Ada Rodriguez, she's over there with um, the guys, and they're getting tattoos. The night on the fr on the, one of the nights that we're supposed to do the big show, the groom is caught with another woman. You stop it. No, he's caught with another woman, on, uh, on, on, and they're on a motorcycle. Wrong show, man. That's yeah. cheaters. Yeah, that, that's, what, that's what we said, man. They, this show turns into cheaters. Yeah. Secretos. The, the, Lati the, Secretos. Tele the Telemundo version oh, one. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You ever watch the Telemundo cheaters? No. It is ridiculous. 
ridiculous. It's amazing. It already. is ridiculous compared Why? to cheaters. Bro, People go nuts? They go nuts. There's this one cheater episode in, in Telemundo. It's called Secretos. Uh, Secretos. They, they, the whole camera crew goes in in somebody's house and they're like a, like a cocaine deal going down at the same time. Oh my God. That's a different kind of secreto. <laughs> That is and insane. They're, they're slapping the coke bag, you know, and f- coke, coke flying everywhere. And then, like, sh- and then I'm watching it going, wait a minute, man. This camera crew and everybody more worried about her being cheated by this yes. kingpin yes. instead of all these drugs here. And <laughs> there's people tied up. Only on secretos. Secretos. Solamente in secretos. <laughs> so it's all fake, bro. They're all fake oh, actors. It was, it was fake. That is really, really funny. That's the secret. That's the secret. The real secret is it's not real. <laughs> what is a bomb that comes to mind? You seem like a guy that, even if it's not going well, you're so likable. I can't Man, see you really tanking. My bombs now are more internally than they are outwardly to people. Facts. And I could go do a show. I do the whole hour. But I could, I could, I could tell you that, and I told my friends, and I, I hope they, they get it. Some they get it. The older comic is, the more they get that one. I, how was it? It was horrible, bro. Yeah. But you did well, yeah. But I felt like I was sitting down watching myself suck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> dude. You are. I didn't. I had great shows this past weekend, and Bill Burr said this to me. I, I was lucky to open for Bill in the early years of stand up, and I had a bad set, and he just went like this. He was like. You wanted you want this with the audience, and he was like, and you you were this. It wasn't like you were bad. It just you never, you never a show never happened. You were a guy talking, and that's I can be going, getting laughs, hitting all the notes, saying all the things, but I have that out of body like, what am I doing? Oh, what's, I hate that feeling. What's this guy? This guy, this guy looks bored or whatever it is. So I'm not. I make this comparison all the time, but it's like having sex. It's like you have sex with your wife, and she's like, where are you? You're still having sex, but you can tell you're not connecting. It's the same thing. It's technically stand-up comedy, but like there's a disconnect. And when I bomb now, bomb, I go off stage and I say, I couldn't find them. It's not that they didn't laugh. You know, the clothes are closed, the applause break here, everybody had a good show, but I'm like, I know what it could have been. It could have been our honeymoon it could have been like this magical thing but it was just jack in the box yeah like <laughs> i don't know what um improv it is i know one of the improv is either ontario or or irvine i stand sometimes i don't know i don't find the right standing position in, in a club like physically physically like i know i gotta be in the middle but I, st- I, uh, I stand over here. I feel like I stand in the wrong spot sometimes. Yeah. Because I know that if I'm walking into the stage, I know where to stand. But if I'm walking in f- to the stage forward, yeah, I don't know where to stand. I know what you mean. And sometimes something like that, well, it's well, a wonder we're not more superstitious. W- comedians are weird. I do the same things every time. But it's because you're trying to control the most uncontrollable situation. So, of course, you're kind of like... You know, I have my magic mind. My opener goes on stage, I drink my magic mind. Then I do this like breath thing. And then I do this and then I have that and then I go out. (laughs) You're still checking it out. Not endorsed by Felipe Esparza. Tastes like Dayquil. (laughs) You said said Nyquil too, the sleepy one, even more insulting. But you know what I mean? Like it's stranger that I'm not like, gotta take the mic out with my right hand. I gotta make sure for me, and one of the reasons I listen to Father Greg before I go on stage, my mantra is, it's not about the words. The bad shows I have are when I think I have to say the words right. But they might even think they're there to hear the jokes. And I feel very strongly about that. this. They're actually there to be in a space with you. They want to go somewhere with you and be in a silly, funny, light safe even if it's kind of risky or whatever but it's still safe it's like a sleepover or like a good hang it's not like nobody drives home and goes maybe they do but i don't really think they're like the words of that one joke it was more like felipe showed up and we he was like the sailboat and we were the wind and and we went fast like everybody's thrilled by that nobody's like he said those words perfect and we were rowing right exactly (laughs) some shows you got to get out and row it's true. I felt like when I, when I did my show in um, in Rotterdam, 
Yeah. At the Club Hog, H U G, is in Rotterdam. <laughs> and other other comedians after there, there was another show after, and it was gonna be in Dutch. <laughs> so my show was in English. And seventy five people showed up. But I've done shows in the past where like it's not sold out. I could do a fifty room like no problem, thirty five. Yeah. But like I, I threw in my old my line I always say when it's not crowded, it killed again. What'd you say? I said, man, welcome to the second show. First show, packed. <laughs> we were turning people away. I didn't even know why we're doing a second show right now. Wow. Because I just had that. Because right? I just throw them off with that. That's great. That's <laughs> great. Yeah, when it's half full, three quarters full even, you're still kind of like, you know they know. That's a great way to address it. But I'm in Rotterdam, you know? Yeah. So I was happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't been there since. Yeah, nobody goes, I'm not a draw in Holland. Like, you, you can't feel bad about that. And, I, and then <laughs> I had um, I, I had Latinos at my show in Rotterdam. Wow. There were um, Latinos who live in Holland. Who knew? I didn't know that. And it doesn't matter if um, if I said I was Mexican over there, because I, I, I didn't have to. Yeah. Because they, they thought I was from Suriname anyways. <laughs> <laughs> or some other place. Do you ever do full sets in Spanish? Yes. I did a full set on Netflix. Oh, you did? I'm sorry. I should have known that. I did. Um, it's called um, Bad Decisions. <laughs> Malos, malas Decisiones. Decisiones Peligrosos. Bad decisions. <laughs> so it was tough, bro, because my Spanish is not like... It's not as... It's not Telemundo Spanish. <laughs> it's more like... Blood in, blood out movie, Spanish. <laughs> like where every other word got to be English. <laughs> like, you know what I'm talking about, me entiendes? <laughs> Hire the radio homes, por favor, skis. You know? So why did you do it? Did so, Netflix want you to do it? I told them I'll do it, I'll do it in both languages. And they said, oh, all right. More oh. money, okay. Yeah. So, so you, did, you taped it twice, once in English, once in Spanish? Is it that's insane? That's yeah, crazy. Yeah, the first night I did two shows in English, and the second night I did two shows in Spanish. And what is the difference performatively? You know, Spanish sounds differently. You know, the 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 way words hit. You can't just translate a, a joke from no. English to Spanish. You got to do something else to it. What do you do? And there was a play on words that didn't work either. Right. And puns don't work. Yeah. And a lot of the words that I was using in the beginning when I was practicing they didn't exist in Spanish language. Like what? Like brecas. What's brecas? Breaks. Yeah. So word made up in California. Brecas. Doesn't exist in the regular like cliques. Spanish. Cliques. No, that's not even a word. Yeah. It's it's called the real word for breaks is frenos. Right. F E R N O S. Frenos. Right, 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 right. And brecas is just a, a Spanglish word made up in LA. Right. Which is which is like you know like white people that don't know how to say a, a Spanish word. So they just add an O at the end of the English word. Right, brecos. Yeah, brecos. Right, right. So we had A-S, brecas. Brecas. It's a feminine word. Yeah, so <laughs> we didn't, I didn't even know making other words I were using were made up. Yeah. So when I went to Mexico to try to do the full set, yeah, it was like, um, it was a very humbling ex experience. <laughs> experience. Experience. I had, I had comedians that were, spa that were speaking Spanish, killing in Spanish. Yeah. And then it goes, oh man, but it go over my notas. <laughs> so I started going over my 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 set list that was written in Spanish. I can't. This is like a nightmare for me. And it was like, oh man. So my twenty percent of the Spanish set is different from the English set because twenty percent of the jokes did not cross over. Wow, they didn't work at all. And is there a a, a taste like? Do Spanish-speaking audiences like a certain kind of humor more than just the English-speaking audience? My Spanish was so American that it's, they liked it because they see like this Pachuco guy, yeah, <laughs> this guy who grew up in, in the United States who speaks Spanish, right, and is messing up bo both languages up. Because <laughs> that's what we do, you know. When you're, when <laughs> we're here to mess up both we're here languages. To mess up both languages. Not so they mess. probably thought that was funny just on its own. Yeah, because I have um, I have like a, a very um, LA accent, and then when I was speaking Spanish, so my I, and I really wanted my Spanish version of the special to be 
for Spanish speaking Americans who live in an English language country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're like a Dominican who speaks Spanish, who's learning how to speak English, but you saw my comedy in Spanish, you're going to love it because you're going to relate to it. Right, 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 right. You're not going for like yeah. native. Because you want to go, like, if you want to go, like my friend um, Carlos Vallarta, he's from Mexico, from Mexico City, and all his humor is totally Spanish. He like his. He's like a very renowned, known comedian, and when he speaks Spanish, I I get it. You know, I get all his jokes. Yeah, but I know, but I'm never gonna speak that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You understand. And more also, than... his English is better than mine too. So yeah, fuck this guy. <laughs> <laughs> we worked together in Montreal. Oh yeah. I opened up for him in English, and I opened up for him in Spanish. Okay. And then when I did my English hour in Montreal. He did a he he picked up a ten minute set and and did it. Give me an example. So let's take a joke like gangs aren't all bad. Oh. At least they carpool. Say that. How do we say that in Spanish? Well, I don't, for, it'll be tough because I don't know the word for carpool in Spanish off right. the bat right now. Piscina de coche. So I have to look it up. <laughs> so I would say that. Um, See right there, man. You're freaking yeah, me out. Stuck. Carpool is is I'm such an English specific word. thing. And I go to uh, see. That you have to say like they share cars. Yeah, um, uh, I don't know. Oh, give me one that you did translate. I will say that. Like, I, I, I will say like, oh, how the gang making joke? I'm not, not want to do it now. Gangs aren't all bad. At least they carpool. That's that was. A... Las pandillas no son tan malas, porque se, se, todos se meten en el coche juntos para para salvar el mundo. To save the world. I, I, but I want to my tata again. He goes, and I said, gangbang is not that bad. You know, they all go inside the car to save the world on the way to kill somebody. That's nice. <laughs> so I did it in Spanish. <laughs> but does that work? They get in the car to save the world. That doesn't, that wouldn't mean they get in the car to go to save the world. No, they get in the cars because they want to protect the world yeah, on the uh, way to protect, kill somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Dude. they're not protecting the world because they're getting rid of, they're getting, they're getting rid of uh, carbon in yeah, the there world. you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very green. They're very green. Or they're getting rid of the carbon that was left by the human. Kind of like Genghis Khan, you know. He <laughs> saved our world. Is that a thing? Yeah, I heard of Genghis Khan. He killed so many people with his army that he depopulated the world and made the world less carbon. Wow. Because of the other people he murdered. Wow. During his wars. That's some Thanos so he's talking stuff about, right um, there. Cleansing the world. Yeah. Genghis Khan, man. He helped. He didn't have to grow no plants. Very green. He just got rid of people. Because we are kind of the problem. Yeah. There's got to be a better way. There's extinctionists now. I think it was uh, like, uh, I I don't know if I didn't read anywhere, but my wife said that she read this article where there's like this island floating in in the ocean somewhere that has all our human trash. It just picked up right there. Oh, it just the trash floats. island. Yeah, trash I've heard of this. Island. Yeah, yeah. Staten Island, I think it's called. Yeah. Come on, Echo guys. Park. We love you, Staten Island. Joe Gatto, good friend of mine. Pete Davidson, come on. We like you. It's a standard joke. Uh, all right. <laughs> Have you ever almost died? No. You going by and beating up people that jumped you and you've never... I've never been a beat up, unconscious, nothing no. like that. No. This is good. I never I'm, I'm ha- I like this answer. Yeah, uh, we, what happened with crack? I just smoked it and loved it. Yeah, it's like a, it's an upper. Yes, yeah, upper. It gets you real. It's similar to coke. I guess it's faster. It's faster. It's faster coke. Yeah, and it just makes you feel euphoria. Yes, I think because when you snort it, you have to wait for the coke to come down your throat and absorb. Yeah, and you if know? you inhale it, you get it right away. Unless you know, like some people. They do it, and they right away they run to the water, and they put water in their nose to make it flow flower. Oh sure. What about PCP? Whenever I read Greg's books, I'm surprised that. Oh, yeah, it's funny. Oh, East LA has PCP. There was a lot of a lot of um, PCP in our neighborhood, and cigarettes dipped in it, and yeah, stuff. Newports. What, what it? Yeah, there you go. What? I thought PCP was like a stronger LSD. No. Tell me. PCP is more like an elephant tranquilizer. Oh, it like calms you down. Yeah. And oh, then wow. you dip your cigarette in there. They, they will dip um, oh, me, mo, mo, um, menthol. Menthol. 
they would dip it like five dollar dip, ten dollar dip, or the whole dip. The whole okay. So how much of it is yeah. like micro penises? Mm -hmm. <laughs> five gram. And did you try it? Yeah, I've done it. And it just relaxes you. I no, man, it, was it makes to be you insane. a very, very violent person. Yeah, like you, it makes you very violent. They, they really have to hog you down. Yeah, like you could fight ten cops. It's not chill. No, man, if you're like a six, six foot five guy, muscles. Yeah, you could take on twenty cops by yourself. Wow, so it's like the Incredible Hulk. Yeah, cigarette. But if you're one guy taking down one guy, it's over. That's crazy because it's just like hacks your adrenal system. You go. You get real fight flight. It's sad because we had a mechanic in our neighborhood named Eli, and um, he was like the best mechanic in the neighborhood. Like he'll fix everybody's car. Like he he didn't have an uh, auto shop. He'll just go to your car and yeah, he'll spend all day fixing your car. Mm. This guy was on PCP while he was doing the cars. Yeah, I remember my friend hired him to do um his his Volkswagen Bug to fix the transmission, and um. Somebody passed by smoking PCP, and they gave him some, and he stood like this holding the wrench for like three hours. Whoa. He never fixed the car. Again? No, he never fixed the car. Oh. He stood there for that long. Just like this. So is he tripping? Tripping, bro. Visuals? I don't know what he's seeing, but he's not fixing the car. <laughs> Car's still broken. I remember my friend, um, you know how Weird Al Yankovic has those songs? Sure. My, and then my friend made up a song um, like, um, Come on, baby, light my fire. Yeah. And my friend was always on something. He was always he was into the doors. And he was like, he'll just make up songs to whatever's going on. Yeah. And he saw Eli right there. He goes, Come on, Eli, fix my tire. Come on, Eli, fix my tire. The, he the time to hesitate is through. You and your brother smoking goose. Come on, Eli, fix my tire. Wow. <laughs> Singing right next to him, too, while he's all sound <laughs> uh, Yeah, man. A, a lot of my humor comes from my neighborhood. Yeah. How, and then how did you kick crack? That's uh, that's one of the most addictive things in the world, isn't it? Father Greg put me in rehab. He did it? Yeah. Oh, we're back, full circle. Yeah, Father Greg came to my house, and he found out that um, I got into a fight with four people, and I bit somebody's ear off, and um, Holyfield. things are bad for me. So he, he drove me to Live Again Recovery Homes in Saugus, California, with his brother Juan Shout Higuera. Out. Shout out. Pastor Juan, Jesse Higuera. And he helped you? Yeah. Wow. I was in a rehab with, I think, like 50 men that were from all over the LA area. Heroin addicts, alcoholics, all, on our religions, our, our rehab with non-denominations. So every Sunday or Saturday, we would get in different cars and go to our respective religion. Like a Jewish guy, he went to his church. And we had an Armenian guy who went with, he was Catholic, he mm. went with our church. And then um, everybody mandatory had to go to this church in Burbank called um, Burbank Community Church mm. with Pastor Jones. Okay. He was a crazy pastor, bro. This guy, he was a very devoted Christian. He was so funny. You know, like, um, he would do his, his um, sermon and then he'll, he'll, he'll throw in in the mix our, our, our rehab, like we're sitting on the side. You got to jump for God the way these men jump for crack. <laughs> <laughs> he, goes, he goes, you got to focus on the Lord. Keep all your focus on the Lord. And then he'll, like, he'll like start talking about how Universal Studios, you know, and movies takes you, takes you away from your focus. Mm. And you start going this one way, but now you're watching Rambo all day. It takes you away from your... Yeah. So you will talk bad about Hollywood. <laughs> but we're like, we're, 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 but I love Rambo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Pastor Jones. And what was it? R.I.P. Okay, so rehab, they get it out of your system. But what did you take away that helps you stay off of it? Well, every day in the rehab, it was like being in a, living in a college dorm, I guess, but it's not yeah. college. 
community. It's all rehab. Yeah. So at eight in the morning, man, we will get up and we have like a morning inspiration where the guy that runs the play, he'll do a quote and do like a 30 minute speech about a quote, like his own set list. <laughs> and then we'll go we'll have breakfast and then we'll go to a bunch of meetings. Mm. And then more meetings, like then NA a break. Meetings. NA meeting, AA meeting, anger management, stuff like that. And yeah. And then some people were working on their GED, and then we'll have a gym. Then we'll clean the whole area. Mm. The place that was the part I hated the most. The cleaning. The cleaning. I'd always I was always I would always pick a rake and stand real far away and pretend I'm raking with no rake because nobody saw me. I would just be like this talking. I can't. I'm so glad you got clean, though. That's really impressive. Everything you've told me is so impressive. I was in rehab with a guy named um, Jesus Quintana. and they, they, we, call him, we call him Chewy. He was like, I don't know, man. He was like, I look at the men that were there, and they were my age now. and But their life was all beat up, man. Their, their life was pretty much done. Me, I, I feel like I'm in my prime. I feel like the... The future awaits, mm. you know, like um, there's still hope. And he, he 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 told me he did like 25 years. Hmm. He said that, he was like, how did you do 25 years? Well, I, first I did 11 straight. Then what? Then I, I was out for 60 days and I went back. I did another nine straight. Mm. Then I got out. They violated me. I did another five. But now I've been out four years. So he's been locked up most of his life. Yeah. He looks at me, he goes, I know you're going to get out soon on a vacation. He goes, this is a picture of my wife. This is where she works. I want you to go over there and give her a big, fat, wet kiss with your tongue. <laughs> what? And I'm like 21 years old, right? I'm supposed to go kiss a 47-year-old woman. For his request. Yeah, he's like 50. You're going to be on Secretos. <laughs> yeah, he's like 59, 60-year-old man. And then I, I just joke around, you know, I ignore him. You didn't kiss her? You didn't go see her? He goes, then I asked him, why do you want me to do this? Because I, I know my wife is messing around, but if you go give her a big weight kiss, I'll know that who she kissed. And her and I could have a big laugh about it and talk and. Connect. Connect. And you're a nice guy, so. And you're, lo you're single. And you know, my wife is hot, man. She's a big, she's a fucking blonde, wet eyed white chick with big old titties. She was telling me. She goes, you can feel her on the hug. <laughs> and then <gasps> I ignored it, right? And then finally, I I saw the where she works. One day, I'm I'm, I'm just cruising in my neighborhood. And I said, okay, I'm going to go check it out. And I see her. And man, she looks like this, like a woman that used to strip in her early 20s, mm. late 30s, mm. and just retired. Mm. Like she had a body and everything, man. Like the, like the kind of woman you want to have on the outside while you're doing life. You know? She was beautiful. And I said, oh, hello. Um, I, was, I'm in, I'm in, um, I was in rehab with your husband, who Chewy. Who Chewy? I said, yeah. And she goes, okay, so where's my big wet kiss? This was like a parade of dudes. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw her and I, and I kissed her, bro. And then she really gave me a kiss. And then she went like this. Mm. No! Yeah. And then she goes, because I was young, bro. Like kissing my grandma, bro. <laughs> my hot ass grandma. <laughs> So I went back to rehab. I told him, yeah, bro, give her a big wicked. All right. He was laughing. This might be the healthiest relationship I've ever heard of. <laughs> we were together for about, we were together. I was with this guy for about a year living with him. And um, he was from a gang in, um, he was from a gang in um, LA. He had a big old ego tattoo. He go, I asked him, where you from? I'm from the original clan. What and I was like, what clan? KKK? Yeah. No, dumbass. Calanton. And I said, Oh shit, I heard of that gang. Okay. 
But he was this old man, bro, like old man. He was telling me these stories that were so unbelievable, bro. Unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Like, unbelievable. Like, I guess when you're locked up forever, like, he was telling me that um, he escaped from prison one time just meditating. Like, he, he got into so meditating, like, real meditating that he meditated and had, like, an out-of-body experience where he left the prison for, like, two weeks. His mind and body and everything, he really felt like he was gone. And I go, wow, man, that's some deep meditating. I've done a lot of drugs and never felt like that. And was his body still in, in the prison? prison? So they didn't notice? They didn't notice. But he felt like he, he escaped prison when he was meditating because he, he got into a meditating stage that he was just gone for two weeks, he said. Wow. That's and that, incredible. He goes, I want to be that high. Yeah, yeah, he was a heroin addict. We were, he was a heroin addict in rehab because most of the people were heroin addicts. And he was also the cook. So I, I kind of like, I became, he took me under his wing. Hmm. So I, I became like the cook assistant with him. Wow. And um, you think he was there? This guy would play dominoes and almost, he would, you know, people play dominoes and they go like this. Um, here's one right here. It's 12, double yeah. 12. This guy would get his his domino, and from way up here, slam it down perfectly, <laughs> and say hog. <laughs> he look at this. He said the club you played in Holland. No, he'll he'll say hog, <laughs> hog. And I go, wow, you're from Netherlands. You know. <laughs> he taught me how to cook menudo and uh, pozole. What's menudo? I know. Menudo I mean. is like this. This stew made with um, cow stomach lining. Okay. Yeah, um, Italians, they eat it with, with marinara sauce. And they have it often? Yikes. Yeah, man. They have it every, <laughs> it sounds every like, week. That sounds like a sometimes food. It's a Sunday food. That should be called a Hungover. <laughs> yeah, it's just tripe. It's, uh, it's just stomach lining and hominy. Wow. That's crazy. Oh, chewy, man. If rest in peace wherever you're at. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. I'll never forget that. We play Trivia Pursuit together. <laughs> He'd do his answers like all the way. <laughs> Slam. Here's the last question, Felipe. I've enjoyed this so much, man. You're such a, such a fun person. Can you tell me a time in your life you laughed really, 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 really hard? Where you're crying, laughing, you think you're going to pee your pants. Maybe you were little. Maybe it was something recently. It doesn't matter. But if you're crying, laughing, where are you? How old are you? And what happened? I'm trying to remember who this. If it was on mushrooms or yeah. Oh man, what? Thought I was gonna have a heart attack. You thought you were gonna have a heart attack? Oh yeah. On mushrooms? Oh yeah. I thought I was gonna have a no. I was laughing so much. Oh man, I was in Seattle, Washington, and we had just finished doing a comedy show, <laughs> and we were already. La well, I was like having a heart, a laugh attack already because mm. we took mushrooms. And we didn't do no other other stuff but mushrooms. No weed, no, I'm sober, so. And we're at the lobby. It was myself, a comedian named Rodrigo Torres, and this other comedian, man, for the, I wish I could give his name right now. Um, Stoner Rob. <laughs> and Even Stoner Rob only took mushrooms, no yes. weed. <laughs> and first of all, he wasn't even, Stoner Rob he left another gig to do our gig, so he was not dressed for the weather. He was wearing like sweats, like basketball shorts, like shanks mm. and boots, you know, Converse and no jacket. So, twenty degrees, he was freezing. Mm. We see, we, we we man, this guy. We we see a cop, a security guard at the at the hotel, and this guy is packing, bro. He had like a, a sidearm. A, a, a gun right here, a gun in his pocket. We could see they had a gun in his foot. Oh, God. This, this is all for the Marriott, you know? <laughs> Protect. Like, he had more guns than the than the, they had, that the Secret Service had on January 6th, bro. <laughs> like, the only person that I would say had more guns with him was a security guard at a taco truck in East LA <laughs> called King, Ta King Taco. That guy right there, man, he is... A proud boy Mexican, bro, protecting <laughs> tacos. But this guy had a kind of guns, right? And then 
There was another guy that wanted to party with us really hard and do other stuff, but we don't. We, we just kept ignoring him, right? Ignoring mm-hmm. him. But he kept text. He kept um, he's talking to one of our friends, and I'm already laughing, but now I start laughing more because his wife keeps calling him, John. Where are you? Right? And he has to pick up the phone every time, and he hangs up. But the the caller ID for his wife was her butthole. So her, with her butthole, bro, her Stop. butthole. Stop. So every, it was a picture of her butthole. Yeah. Who, who, so he, first he goes, "Who's that?" Oh, my wife. Hey, she wondered where the fuck it was. I go, and then my friend started, "Well, but you better hang that up." But I didn't know that he was saying, "You better hang that up," so we could keep seeing the butthole over and over. So man, so I'm already laughing, right? And that, and then that guy doesn't know why we're laughing. I'm on the floor. And he goes, man, she keep, then he goes, man, you keep, and then he goes, hang up, man, let's see if she calls again. Eh? So then he keeps watching it over and over. <laughs> and then she fucking shows up and goes, why are you fucking picking up the car, man? <laughs> oh, my God. And then when she starts screaming, <laughs> and then the security guard shows up with all those guns, which makes it more funnier. <laughs> And then the guy goes, hey, hey, man, um, this is officer, officer safety here. Uh, we heard um, there's been a, a disturbance a, a disturbances with a butthole. We want to, uh, everybody, please uh, put your pants down and we want to get to the bottom of this crevice. We need to do a lineup. Whose butthole is this? Yeah, he's doing, <laughs> so he's doing that. Um, he's doing the voice, but he's also doing the, the not done. You know, from the police show. Yes, yeah, yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Dun, dun, dun. He law and ordered you. Yeah. Oh man. my god. Over a butthole. <laughs> so then um <laughs> she leaves and then the car keeps coming in, man. Again. But I didn't know I didn't I never got to see the photo. But he was the one that was we just kept laughing. <laughs> Because he turned around and goes, bro, this guy, let's look at the screen, but never got to see it. He oh, saw it. Oh, my God. But, man, we just couldn't stop laughing, I will man. never forget my the star, like I was like. <coughs> <coughs> you, th- you thought you were going to die. I thought I was going to die. Like, so you have almost died. I was dying, <laughs> I was dying laughing like those, um, those laughing hyenas from that cartoon movie from back yeah. in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lion King. The one with rabbits. No. Oh, man. Um. Not Lion King? Yeah, they were laughing until they died, right? Oh, no. No, no, it was the one with um, that comedian, Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit. Yeah, those, those hyenas would laugh themselves to death. That was almost you. That was me, man. Um, I, I really couldn't stop breathing, bro. I thought I was going to die. My eyes were watery, and I felt like I'm never going to laugh this much again. <laughs> that was a great one. What a classic. <laughs> Felipe. Hang up, bro. Let her call again, eh? She keeps calling. Why not just look up the photo, I say? <laughs> Go into the context. That is incredible. You are incredible. Where sh- you're on tour. Where, where, what are we going to plug? Yes, I'm going to be in um, Louisville, Kentucky. Okay, Louisville. At Louisville or Louisville. They say it rhymes. Louisville. Louisville, Louisville. Kentucky. The place that makes the Louisville, Louisville struggle. Slugger. Sluggers. Which you got to keep in your trunk with a catcher's mask. Yes. For the police. And I'm going to um, the shipwreck tour with Impractical Jokers. Oh, okay. And Steve O and the Eric Andre. This is great. And I'm, I'm also I'm on, the, I'm on the Eric Andre show, season five and six, some of four, of, of three. Nice. That's yeah. awesome. This and got- check out the, my, all my tours at philippesworld.com. I'm on a tour called um, Big Fool Tour. Big Fool. Yes. And I'm also doing the Netflix The Joke in March. Okay. I have my own show. It's called Felipe and Friends. It's going to be like Felipe's Unsung Heroes. There you go. Which I, well, I'm going to have my openers. Okay. And like uh, one of the, the best openers that, you know, you know, like sometimes like you say, man, who does Louis C.K. take to open? Mm. Or who, do, who does um, David Tell take to open? Yeah. Who does... Um, What's his name? Um, so uh, Larry Bubbles Brown. I don't know if you know him. Mm-hmm. Murr. He holds the record for being the the longest gap between Letterman's. He did Letterman in 94, 96. 
and then he didn't do it again till 2007. Wow, what a strange record. Yeah, and I didn't then we um, were counting that. Then there's Chuck Bartel okay. from Minnesota, very funny guy. So you bring all your openers yeah. and do a show. That's great. I'm doing Netflix as a fest. It's, it's just me. <laughs> you know what's funny, I'm man? Not, I'm not helping anybody. You know, but, uh, inclusion, <laughs> you say that. Yeah. Like, I want to be on that list. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I know, like, some people who are not on a Netflix, it's a joke festival. Yeah. You know they're not on the and then show. You can, you can and they feel them. like they shouldn't be on the show. I should be on that fucking show. Yeah. These fucking comedians suck. But yeah. you know what? I I was on the show. But you know when they put out that flyer where it says yeah. all the comedians are gonna be on? Yeah. My name was not on it. <gasps> no list. No list. Not on the list, but I'm on the show. Then I asked, you know, we start asking around. Well, wow, we wanted to keep it private. We wanted to keep it private. Why private? It's a show. Yeah. <laughs> we, we're gonna, Tom Brady, there's going to be a, the, the roast of Tom Brady. So you can get that a secret or me a secret. <laughs> but you know, like at first you're like. Is that happening? Is that announced? Yeah. yeah. The, the, no, no, In the festival in March. The roast. The, the, yeah. But is that a oh, secret? Shit, did I? Did I? I heard that. Huh? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's happening? Okay. Yeah. So, um. But when that when the whole lineup came up, my name was not in the lineup. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I was like, Netflix is a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will be on the festival. I am yeah, on the yeah. festival. Yeah, but all all kidding aside, I but will not be on the, the flyer. Festival. But I will be on the festival. That that matters so you much. Want to know where it's gonna be? I just go to look for me. Felipe'sWorld.com. Yes, it is. Thank you for doing this, man. Thanks for having me. Would you say keep it crispy? It's how we end the guests. What's up? We'll keep it crispy. <laughs> Without any explanation. I love that so much. And you added a what's up, fool. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. This Thank was awesome. You, Appreciate it. You